I will now pass the floor to today's MC, Ms. Michiko Yoshida from Chula Longhorn University. Michiko, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hermes. Good morning, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. And for those of you joining us from up from the other parts of the globe, good afternoon and good evening. Sawadika. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Michiko Yoshida. I'm the Director of Global Networking and Engagement from the Office of International Affairs and Global Network, Shulanonko University. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our virtual conference, Civic Engagement, Co-Designing Resilient Global Communities. Today, we are joined by speakers and panelists with outstanding leadership in public engagement practices. Although they represent diverse professional communities and expertise, they are connected by a shared vision and aspiration of creating resilient global communities, which is a path to a sustainable society. As one of the organizers, I'm grateful to be able to have this opportunity with all of you to reflect on our challenges, opportunities, and our responsibilities for action as global citizens, given the extraordinary context that we are in. Our program today is now shown on the screen. We will have distinguished resource persons to speak for us in the opening session, followed by a book launch. Then we will have a panel discussion number one. After lunch break, we will have panel discussion number two. Then we will be wrapping up with synthesis and closing remarks. The program is expected to end around 15.30 Bangkok time. Thank you for your kind attention. May I first of all invite Professor Bandi Iwa Pon, President of Sri Lanka University, to give opening remarks. Professor Bandit, please. Distinguished speakers, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the virtual conference, Civic Engagement, co-designing resilient global communities. Since its inception, Chulalongkorn University's mission has been to serve the public. To fulfill this mission, Chulalongkorn University engages in a wide range of efforts, striving to lead in creating knowledge and innovations that will build and support a sustainable society. I am therefore grateful that we are able to host this important virtual conference in collaboration with our key partners from both academic and practitioner expertise. It is a valuable opportunity to share knowledge for action toward more resilient global communities. Global level crisis of unprecedented scale in our recent history are causing serious socioeconomic impacts to reverberate across the world affecting all sectors of society. Given the scale and severity of the situation, we cannot expect any single government or any single sector to manage the crisis or institute lasting solutions to the challenges. We are indeed at a turning point. Our question is, how can we create a sustainable society? This requires resilient global communities for all citizens. Thus, there is a clear need to co-design a new common framework of global action in which all stakeholders can participate. We need to re-examine fundamental socio-cultural norms, values and behaviors and coordinate action towards genuine solutions to the challenges we face together. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I, be I believe we have a unique opportunity at hand to enable a positive transformation of our society. Civic engagement and dialogue are indispensable tools in spurring innovation with our continued effort in partnership. I am confident we can inspire new action and policy innovation to transform our society. This is why Chulalongkorn University continues to highly value our local and global engagement. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to Madame Erna Vitola, former UN Special Ambassador for Millennium Development Goals, for delivering a keynote address today. Madame Edna is a true inspiration for all of us, supporting citizens at all levels by initiating several civil society organizations, leading philanthropic activities and working closely with communities. My special appreciation goes to Ms. Kita Sabbawal, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Thailand, who connects us with rich partnership opportunities to work together toward achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Last but not least, I want to convey my sincere appreciation to all of our speakers today. I very much look forward to the knowledge co-creation, which will further the design of resilient global communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bandit. Next, it is my pleasure to invite Ms. Gita Sabawal, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Thailand. Chulalongkorn University values our international partnerships in working toward achieving the sustainable development goals. We are especially grateful for the invaluable support we receive from Ms. Sabawal and her team at the UN Resident Coordinator Office in Thailand. Ms. Sabawal, please. It's a pleasure to be able to address you today, recognizing the long-standing role of Chulalongkorn University as a key civic space in Thai society, furthered by the Civic Engagement 4.0 initiative that brings us here together. Certainly, I want to discuss strategies for civic engagement and how we can do better and be more inclusive in both policy and practice. But first, I think there is an important acknowledgement Civil society in a very real sense is us, our friends and family, colleagues and neighbors. And now many members of society are experiencing deeply felt hardship because of the COVID public health risk, as well as the major socioeconomic disruption. This confers a responsibility to work together to build resilience. And it also informs the most effective responses to the evolving and interconnected challenges we face. Civic engagement could not be a more timely topic. The UN mandate to build back better from this pandemic reflects this move towards more equitable, inclusive and sustainable societies. And as the UN Secretary General says, a better world requires us to meet people where they are and to keep them front and center of our thoughts and actions. Such engagement is the glue that holds society together and is a source of strength during difficult times. The UN and the international community have frameworks in place to guide our collective effort in the form of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, among other vital international compacts. In Thailand, the UN brings international expertise and most importantly, the shared network of partnerships to support progress towards the SDGs 
in alignment with national development goals, focusing in particular on the green and sustainable economy, leave no one behind, and the development of human capital by strengthening institutions and partnerships, and in particular, empowering people and civil society. The key themes of today's discussion, dignity, justice, and sustainability, reflect both our aspirations in these partnerships as well as the challenges. We know that civic spaces protecting freedom of expression are shrinking in part justified by the COVID-related restrictions. In Thailand, the ongoing protest movement signals the need for more, not less, public participation and engagement in governance and formal institutions. For our part, the UN needs to do a better job with community outreach, particularly meeting young people where they are, listening and acting upon their concerns and contributions to build effective cross-sectional partnerships, including investing in the power of local knowledge. In the recent survey launched on the 75th anniversary of the UN, less than 20% of respondents in Thailand reported that they were aware about the SDGs. Leading priorities for the next five years were labor and skill development, as well as reducing social inequalities. Listening and valuing these voices is crucial to meaningful civic engagement. In a recent discussion, one young woman made a stark point to me that we all need to hear. She said she is afraid that she will die young because of climate change. We simply cannot ignore concerns such as this in crafting inclusive and effective policies today. The UN SDG Youth Panel has clearly told us their priorities, including about the consequences of the pandemic on education and widening inequalities, as well as the focus on technology, including calling for universal internet access to bridge the digital divide. Importantly, they also urge the government to focus on root issues involving democratic rights to enable civil society empowerment through a human rights approach. Chula Longkorn University has a well-established standing as a forum for civic activities and wellspring of expertise, including the SDG Academy that is under development to support lifelong learning, not just for students, but also faculty, staff, alumni, and members of local communities. The UN is drawing on global resources to support the university's commitment. This is why I would like to propose an annual dialogue between civil society and the UN to strengthen the strategic partnership. This could provide a co-created and shared platform while also sending a strong signal conveying the importance of civic engagement in sustainable development. I look forward to our future discussion and the follow through actions and partnerships that are so essential to meet the multiple challenges facing us facing us today thank you thank you very much ms sabawal for the rich sharing if i may continue it is my great honor to invite our keynote speaker, Madame Erna Wittola. Ibu Erna is an extraordinary leader and public intellectual of our time. She served as special ambassador for the Millennium Development Goals in Asia Pacific and is a founder and leader of civil, several civil society organizations, including Indonesian Environment Forum, Indonesia Biodiversity Foundation, and Philanthropy Indonesia. Without further ado, may I now call upon Ib Elna, please. Honorable President of Chulalongkorn University, Professor Dr. Bundit Yuyapon, the UN Resident Coordinator in Thailand, Ms. Gita Sabarwal, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and peace be upon you. I would first like to give my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the Chulalongkorn University for hosting this book launch and 
important webinar on this timely issue of civic engagement co-designing resilient global communities. I would also like to appreciate the initiators and organizers of the publication of the book Civic Engagement in Asia Lessons from Transformative Learning in the Quest for a Sustainable Future, especially Muhammad Indrawan from the University of Indonesia, Jakarta, and Ms. Michiko Yoshida from Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok, members of the Civic Engagement Initiative. This book is a compilation of presentations from the Civic Engagement for a Just and Sustainable ASEAN, Our Stories and Practices workshop that took place in Yogyakarta from August 11 till 15 in the year 2017. Participants were Asian public intellectual and activists, people with such rich background and who are so committed to civic engagement, especially at the community and local levels, and who at the same time have managed to influence national and global policies. I am honored to be participating in this workshop too as I was among those invited to share my stories and practices there. We see from the concrete examples collected in this book that ordinary people can be the drivers of genuine development. They can develop innovative and creative solutions through social and ecological enterprise. Despite of being only four years away, this workshop seems to happen already a long time ago. Since that time, everything has changed. Our countries, cities, and neighborhoods have changed so much. We can hardly remember how these quote-unquote good old times were. We seem to be entering a new era of multiple crises, not just the pandemic crisis, but what has evolved into a multidimensional prolonged crisis. Starting from a health crisis, it has grown larger and larger into social, economic, and political crisis, not to mention more environmental degradation and neglected climate change responses. In trying to solve all this, our governments are grappling for solutions, trying to build trial and error efforts with clumsy and continuously changing policies. But we, the so-called non-state actors, can't be too critical on this, as we are also not really getting smarter in our decisions and actions with so many fakes, unclear contradictory news, many hoaxes, etc. Not to mention the unprecedented for our lifetime, steep increase of deaths and miseries, some quite close to our lives. Friends, relatives, neighbors, leaders, etc. Death are constantly peeping through our windows and we have no idea at all when all these miseries will end and for some time it's almost paralyzing us but we don't have the luxury to stay paralyzed and stop thinking while the global pandemic is impacting the whole world indiscriminately we can recognize the disproportional impact and challenges experienced by the poor and the vulnerable. While the pandemic continues to hit hard on people's lives, we were also reminded that climate change does not stop and natural disasters continue to affect our lives. This crisis has slowed the response to the climate crisis like the shift to renewable resources and sustainable levels of energy use, thus ensuring that climate breakdowns will continue to be a core threat to the planet and to 
humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, obviously we need to start with resilience at the local level. Here, three things are important. To build the community's absorbing capacity, buffering capacity, and local response capacity. Here, local culture and wisdoms related to mitigation and adaptation of disasters are utmost important. Also, the constant revival of cultural awareness and value to build strength, unity, and collaborations. We need to be encouraged to take proactive actions to ensure resilience is indeed for all, including people who often tend to be excluded. Resilience is the ability of women and men to realize their rights and improve their well-being despite shocks, stresses, and uncertainties. Building local communities resilience is something we have been working on for some time, be it in facing disasters, wars, political turmoil, etc. And we all have the experience, knowledge, and data in handling them. What are the paths we take to build resilient global communities? And how do we work on building resilient communities at the global level? I still believe in the SDGs roles and as a global consensus, despite being held hostage by COVID-19. The SDGs are more integrative in nature. To accelerate SDGs implementations, usually we study and understand the interdependencies between priority or relevant goals, develop interlinked programs, and develop synergic partnerships. For instance, water and sanitation concerns have to be addressed at all level relevant sectors, including industry and labor market. With such multi-sectoral requirements, interactive multiple stakeholder processes are urgently needed. In this way, SDGs are more inclusive. Another example, women's issues have come to the foreground. Throughout the process of setting the SDGs, we see gender mentioned in almost all the goals, 12 goals to be exactly. At present, gender equality is not just one separate goal and it is not just a problem for women. It is everybody's challenge. Whatever goal you are working on, whether you are working on job creation or any other issues, gender is an important and integral part of the picture. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has delayed progress towards achieving the SDGs, with some goals perceived to be more impacted than others. The top three most impacted goals by COVID-19, according to Indonesian stakeholders, are goals on poverty, number goal one, health and well-being, goal three, and decent work and economic growth, goal eight. But there are also studies saying that COVID is impacting all goals, endangering the SDGs achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, fortunately, there are also blessings in disguise in the COVID-19 pandemic that can accelerate SDGs implementation they can put our progress towards achieving the SDGs back, some goals more accelerated than others. For instance, the quote-unquote new habit in cities of walking, cycling, public transportation, etc. can accelerate goal 7 on affordable clean energy, cleaner and healthier lifestyle, 
healthier food, regular stop activities, accelerate the health and well-being goal number three. Limiting mobility by among other work, study, and pray from home has shown improvement in air quality, blue skies, etc. and can accelerate sustainable cities and communities goal with civic engagement to promote advocate and broaden the outreach all the communities acting together can really make a difference we can proceed further as almost all the SDGs are local goals whatever we want to achieve if we do not directly work at the local level we will not meet the SDGs that is why we need community engagement through bridging by activists who know the local level very well, who know the resources that exist at the national and regional level, and who can assure the communities who will use them. SDG's priorities should not be decided at the national level only, and we are happy that slowly some of the national officials are becoming quite understanding of this concept. Transformation is not just a keyword for one's program. It is a keyword for anyone wishing to achieve changes because it is not easy to pull together diverse interests and actors in diverse modes and environment. To build resilience Sorry, to build a national or regional team, we need quality leadership to facilitate that. The SDGs are a set of concepts that, if applied, can bring us closer to what we need to reach. So, try to com- try comprehending them because both the processes and products of the SDGs are rich in knowledge, in commitments, and in materials for future studies and for transformative learning. They offer a very clear and suitable way to move the people in the region toward long-lasting partnerships. With the wider and more diverse issues and concerns of SDGs, as well as the increased challenges of governance, partnerships, and regional leadership, there must be transformative learning. How do we catalyze the transformation and make it really useful for the people we have been working for? Because the SDGs are so wide-ranging and so noble in their aim to reach everybody, to leave no one behind, they have to be supported by many different means of implementation and diverse source of financing. Fortunately, again, the processes to achieve the goal, pledges of SDGs and other recent agreements are quite inclusive. They are built on stronger ownership and stronger commitments. Consequently, I'm quite excited about the idea of everybody doing something to achieve SDGs on whatever level they can. It is important to deepen engagement. With whatever one is doing, there are many roads, many potential partners, many potential transformations need to be developed and studied. I believe that we must always start from the local level, which is where the strength of the people on the ground is rooted. In conclusion, I hope that from this webinar, many innovative and positive solutions will come up. I also hope that we really can enlarge the community engagement players to really achieve the critical mass to reach the global momentum. I wish you all a fruitful discussion 
so we all can inspire and work with younger generations to shape a development path that is more equitable, peaceful, sustainable, and resilient. Thank you for your kind attention. I wish you all the best. Please stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much, Ibu Elna. As she kindly mentioned during her speech, uh, Ibu Elna has been a guardian angel of our civic engagement initiatives ever since we organized our first regional workshop four years ago on civic engagement for just and sustainable ASEAN, our stories and practices. The sharing and findings from the workshop um, inspired and supported us to to create the Civic Engagement 4.0 platform. Now, uh, Ib Enna has been very generous. He kind, she kindly joined us today. Ib Enna, good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm what? Yes, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for your generosity. Yeah. And uh, Ib Enna uh, is, uh, uh, can take up some questions. Uh, she's generous to <laughs> take up some questions from the floor. So I'd like to invite um, um, perhaps some, some participants from the floor. If you, uh, may I see your hands? Not too many, please, because we have so <laughs> many speakers. Yes, <laughs> I, see, I see my colleague, uh, Ted Mayer, raising his hand. Um, yes, please go ahead, Ted. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I'm struck in your speech um, by the many crises that we face now. And uh, I, I, I feel concerned because this work for dignity, justice, and sustainability, as you've outlined, there's so many dimensions of, you know, for, for example, dignity for workers, uh, justice, dignity for women, uh, sustainability for farmers. There's so many dimensions which are already very challenging. But it seems to me that with the pandemic surging in Southeast Asia, in Indo Indonesia, in Thailand, in Myanmar, and then also with, uh, with governments, at least in mainland Southeast Asia and particularly Man Myanmar, uh, uh, either incapable or trying to control, I would say, I, I guess there's a little feeling of despair. And I I don't feel despair deeply, but I wonder how do you prioritize? You know, there's so many directions for our work. And given this kind of onslaught of difficulties where so many ordinary people are thinking about their own survival, um, what do you have any thoughts on how do you prioritize your work and your attitude and, or, or for us as activists? Thank you, Ted. Can I answer right now or wait for other? Yes, I can. Okay, my priority is very, very simple: to stay healthy and to stay alive. Okay, <laughs> that should be all our priority. There, there's no use if you're not there yet. Yeah? How can you implement your priority? Okay, that, that's number one. And then it should go in a larger, larger uh, scale. And then uh, the priority is choosing us. And then some because I have so many priorities before the pandemic. But now there are a few that are reaching out to me yeah, to handle, like this uh, webinar, for instance, that forced me to think of how to uh, enlarge civic engagement yeah, and, and as one solution. Yeah. So that, that is our priority goal yeah. on how we reach that. We should do whatever we are good at. Yeah. This, that's again a very simple natural limitation imposed on us because of the crisis. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I see another hand. Uh, Toshi? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Elna. Actually, my question is related to uh, the previous question. Um, I remember back in 2017, when I uh, first listened to your uh, opening speech, uh, you walked us through 
uh, the history of civic engagement, starting from the uh, UN Rio summit or even earlier, constantly expanding uh, civil society space and engaging with uh, uh, different actors of the society in expanding ways. But in today's speech, now you're saying we are entering a new era uh, because of uh, new challenges such as climate change and, and uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So I understand that uh, we have to uh, uh, think of a way out so that we can proceed with uh, civic engagement at further steps. And for civic engagement 4.0, uh, where we are you know, coming together today, we have uh, justice and dignity as, as core values. And my question is, how does this sound to you? Do, do you think uh, 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 justice and, and dignity can be a concept that at least guide us to, to find you know, ways out, um, to find new ways of uh, pushing through our civic engagement agenda? Uh, is there anything missing or, or uh, is there anything uh, we have to be uh, thinking about these two, two concepts in particular? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi-san. I am sorry to maybe I give a more uh, a pessimistic or not so inspiring answer in your question because I think this crisis like I said, we did not design it. It's imposed on us, yeah? So we have to just to, we have to be creative, we have to be innovative in adjusting what we're doing, what we have been doing into something that we can do right now at this moment, yeah? Or else, yeah, we're still thinking of this concept, this concept, we're not getting anywhere. And there are many uh, urgent things that needs to be done at the local level that needs leadership from people like you. Yeah. So uh, start with whatever, whichever community we can do so. Yeah. And then broader and broader. Yeah. Uh, of course, we need to, uh, uh, to, uh, to accelerate this process yeah, to, to make it larger. And that's why we have this webinar. If each of the participants of the webinar can enlarge whatever they think they can do at this moment, I think we're on the right track. Let's, uh, let's forgive our governments and let them do whatever they uh, are doing, uh, etc. We concentrate on our target group and empower them, be it women, be it young people, be it village people. We continue to empower them yeah, to do whatever they can do at that level. Yeah. Then we have a critical mass yeah, at, the low, at the provincial level, at the national level, that eventually will go to the global level. In the meantime, there are people like you, like uh, all the colleagues here, that also work from the global level down to national actors like us. And so then we, we can meet there. That's the most realistic. If you ask me maybe in three, four years from now, I can give you a more intelligent reply. Now I'm honestly admitting that it is not possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know all these uh, will be taken up during the panel discussion as well. And then uh, your, um, you know, this uh, initial set of uh, uh, articulation from Ibu is very, very uh, helpful. Thank you so much, Ibu, once again, for your kind time today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The... Yes, now um, we would like to um, move to the next segment of the program, the book launch. Um, I think you now see the screen. Thank you. So the two speakers to officiate the book, book launch uh, uh, are the editors of the volume, Dr. Mohammad Indrawan, uh, who's a research scientist at the Research Center for Climate Change 
Universitas Indonesia, and Mr. Ted Mayer, Academic Director, Institute of Transformative Learning at the International Network for Engaged Buddhists, or INEB. Indrawan and Ted, over to you. Thank you, Michiko-san, for the opportunity. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Sawadikap, uh, Selamat pagi. Good morning from Bogor City, Indonesia, and peace be upon us all. My name is Muhammad Indrawan from Universitas Indonesia, and I help compile the edited volume. That is with Mr. Ted Mayer, Dr. Jeffrey Lazar, and Dr. Helen Hanna. So uh, this is a book about transformative learning written in 24 chapters by 31 change maker from the ground. Can we see the cover of the book, please? Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the background, the background is that uh, as <clears throat> already uh, mentioned by our distinguished uh, speakers, there is there are concerns uh, for what is called lacunae in civic engagement, or in other words, chronic disconnections among the region's state and non-state actors. Uh, thereby, uh, with uh, the leadership from Chulalongkorn University and working with so many stakeholders, uh, uh, there is a develop uh, and continuous shared learning approach in support of sustainable development. So uh, the book has two uh, straightforward uh, objectives. One is to strengthen the co-production of knowledge. Professor Bundit Yeroporn before said that co-creation of knowledge as they relate to sustainability. And the other one is to crystallize the process of transformative uh, learning. So next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, 24 chapters, 31 uh, civic uh, engagement uh, uh, activists. And uh, I, if I can be fair, I have to mention the 24 chapters, but with so limited time, uh, I ask your permission to mention only a few ones that is random, uh, randomly chosen, <laughs> randomly chosen, uh, because they are also excellent. So let me begin with number seven. Number seven is Miss Chandra Kirana. It's amazing. Uh, the multiple years of dedication she, she does to support uh, traditional textile artisans of East Sumba, Indonesia. And uh, most amazingly, she brought together the triple bottom line, that is ecology, economy, and social. So that's number seven. And then number 11, it's uh, Professor Lakana Taikuroya. So uh, Ajan uh, Lakana uh, provides a very compelling uh, 10 years, 10 years of uh, experience uh, fighting public perception and even hoaxes that would have cost people their lives because they do not really uh, know about the danger of uh, box jellyfish. That is number uh, 11. And then uh, next, number 12, is Miss Mariko Komatsu. Uh, this is also very impressive because she and her group uh, is building a kind of citizen science. So in times of disaster, she has the, the hindsight to build the local capacity using science and uh, making it less dependent on outside effort. But its community, they learn to use Geiger counter and so on. So uh, the 24 chapters uh, include the topics of ecological sustainability, 
indigenous people tenure, right-based approach, citizen science, public health, human security, faith-based ecological sustainability, sustainability uh, in the beautiful words of Dr. Diki Sofyan, who also has a chapter, the hardware of ecological sustainability. Next, please. So I will just, uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So I will just uh, make a very, uh, again, a random uh, mention of all the excellent articles. So uh, Mr. Theodore uh, Mayer, he uh, uh, not only he, he built a significant movement for international network of engaged Buddhism, but he also bring his students, very young, uh, maybe in the early 20s, to share their rather inspirational and very personal transformative learning. So those are three chapters already by Mr. Pet Mayer himself and his two fine students, Miss Rabin Rongpipi and Mr. Mahesh Amankar. Lastly, lastly an uh, uh, inspirational chapter by Ibu Anna Witular. Uh, she carried a, a rare, a rare bird's eyes view, including history and lessons in civic engagement and profound wisdom for all the fight for sustainability from the eyes of sustainability promoter. And uh, here uh, you can also read how she explained that local leadership matters for the sustainable development. Uh, next, please. I would like, yeah. Uh, I would like to hand over to Mr. Ted Mayer, please. Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Indra One. Um, I, uh, I want to say, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, okay, good. good. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to say first that I'm so grateful for having had the opportunity to be part of this, uh, of creating this volume as an, as a writer of one chapter, but also as uh, one of the associate editors, and also having been part of the parallel process of the civic engagement 4.0. And uh, for, it's really been an incredible learning opportunity. And that's the first thing I would like to say about what makes this book published by Obor, the Indonesian publisher, so valuable. That's my first point is I think it will be uh, an incredible learning experience for you if you have the chance to read it. Um, next, I'd like to, I think I've been asked to read this uh, comment out loud that this is a, a a comment by one of the re outside reviewers of our book uh, by Julian Caldecott, Dr. Julian Caldecott. The community orientation is consistent and strong in this book, that is, reminding us that our lives really only make sense in a social and ecological context. The result is that the book bears comparison with the foundational volume, The Wealth of Communities stories of success in local environmental management by C. Pi Smith and G. B. Feyerabend um, in 1994. This places it within a current renaissance of appreciation for community-based environmental management, which is fast becoming prominent as a key way for societies to adapt to climate change and ecological chaos. Uh, so I have maybe five or six points that I'd like to make about what I believe makes this volume so worth your while and, and so worthy of a wider readership. So the first point is quite simple, that in these 24 chapters, you will have a, a bird's eye view and even a close up view of people within the Asian region who are trying to do something new. In every single chapter, there is some sense of innovative and, and even visionary uh, concepts 
about where we need to go and then how we could actually move in that direction. The, the chapters are often very practical and, and they show someone or uh, who is working on trying out a new idea, trying out a new way of doing things, trying out a way of building networks. So I think this is incredibly valuable. The, the focus is on Southeast Asia, but it, it extends to Japan in the East and to Pakistan in the West. And uh, of course, uh, islands, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, but also even Papua New Guinea. So it's quite an extraordinary view. Um, secondly, who is it that is uh, that we're talking about here? The people who are trying and innovating, trying to do something new. Um, and what I find really striking is that um, we all know that those who are activists, grassroots activists, live very much in an activist world. And those who are university professional scholars often live very much in the high demands and the high pressures of a university world. And it's somewhat rare that they come together, but this is absolutely what we see in this volume, is that we see those from the university are what we might call scholar practitioners or scholar activists who are trying to apply their knowledge, their hard-won knowledge. And, and this should not be rare, but unfortunately, I think it is somewhat rare and it's very beautiful. And at, on, for, uh, in the same way, those who are act, uh, grassroots activists are coming from, a, um, from an, uh, 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 an, uh, uh, an educated point of view and in exchanging ideas, in a process of exchanging ideas with university professors and with policymakers. And finally, we also have at least three people writing in this book who are actually policymakers. Um, the third point, so, so there's a great diversity and uh, it's the kind of interchange that we, I think we need to move towards um, in, in facing the tremendous crises we're facing. The third point is that every single writer in this book is part, reflects in their chapters being part of some kind of network. Uh, in many cases, the writer has actually is actually the founder of the network or has established the network. But, but in this way, again, you, you see uh, the great diversity of, of communities, local communities, including indigenous groups, including international com uh, uh, interreligious communities and so on. So, so with every chapter, you'll get a sense of some kind of community, of, of some kind of building of networks and connections. Um, and one of, part of the crisis we face is that we're so disconnected. So, so when you see those connections, I think it's very hopeful. Uh, uh, finally, oh, not finally, um, there's something, I, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm also a language teacher. And, I, and one of the languages I have taught is English. And so um, this may seem a strange thing to focus on, but I am the only author in this volume who is a native English speaker. Now, there are several other authors who are completely, absolutely competent in English, in written English, in literary English, in publication English, but many of the authors are not. In other words, they are wonderful activists. They are also wonderful writers in their native languages. But to be honest, uh, I myself and my uh, and, and Indrawan, the main editor, um, and the associate editors, really needed to do quite a bit of work um, so that the language of each of the writers could be at an international high quality um, English standard level for publication. And I personally am very proud of our work in that, in that regard. A and, um, and what it means for you as the reader though, is that you would have the chance to read um, highly articulate and clear conceptualizations and clear reflections um, from writers who would not normally participate in this English world publication process um, by, by virtue of their own um, language skills. So in, in some cases, we literally were in communication, almost interviewing uh, authors, what do you mean by this? And, and then in receiving very practical, concrete examples, we were able, able to help the authors to shape their language. So I think you'll 
appreciate the language of all of the authors in this volume. Um, if, uh, the, the other really important thing is that this, this volume is aptly titled as Civic Engagement and Transformative Learning in, a quest, in the Quest for a Sustainable Future. So the transformative learning is something that I focus on in my work, but I also feel is absolutely key for all of us because the challenges we face cannot be faced if we are not in an ongoing learning process. So what you will find is that in every single chapter, there is some process, often a very deep process of reflection by the author on what they learned in trying to do something new. Um, and often you will see the mistakes. You will see that, that the authors learned from their mistakes. Um, and, and so the, the, the volume, this book is a, is a process of sharing a, de a deeper uh, kind of reflection from a, a wide and diverse group of act activists and scholars in Southeast Asia and beyond uh, on their own work. So I think it's a very personal view that you also get. It's not uh, a kind of abstract, distant, or scientific language as, as, as useful and wonderful as those are. Finally, um, the production of this volume has benefited from a process of exchange of many of these same authors. And here I want to briefly appreciate the role that uh, Indrawan has played in first proposing the volume and then uh, very consistently seeing it through to its publication. Um, but, but that process of uh, exchange, maybe we could go to the next slide here. I think that would be appropriate. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so, so this is the title that, had, that was given to this process at some point, Civic Engagement 4.0, Dignity, Justice, and Sustainability. And here again, I've been so grateful by virtue of my work with the International Network of Engaged Buddhists based in Bangkok to have been part of this process, which has included, um, I'll, I'll just speak informally here from my perspective, a series of small scale meetings and then ever larger meetings, including a wonderful meeting um, in, uh, in Solo, uh, Surakarta, Indonesia. And, and this is a kind of regional platform that has been uh, really put forward by uh, Jula Longkorn University. And I feel we can all be very grateful for the work that Jula Longkorn University has done in this regard to make it possible for uh, Southeast Asian and Japanese and other activists and scholar practitioners and researchers and young adults and mayors of uh, Indonesian cities and Thai cities all to come together to share their perspectives on where we are in this global crisis and what we can do to actually do something useful and constructive and productive. Um, uh, while Jula Longkorn University has taken the lead in this, uh, supported by various foundations, Japanese and others, I also want to mention the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies, which has also played a very strong supporting role, as have many other organizations who are too many really uh, to mention right now. But the, the um, the, the meeting in uh, Solo, uh, Indonesia was also part of a process that we have called the, the Bangkok Forum, or I could say the Bangkok Forum is part of this larger civic engagement initiative. The 4.0, uh, I understand, is to highlight the very, the, 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 the tremendous importance of being uh, technology literate in in the way we plan and build the, our activities, our actions, our advocacy campaigns, and in the way we build our networks. Um, I'll, I'll mention too that, that at the solo workshop, there was a wonderful um, meeting that I've never seen before of, Indo uh, of mayors from around Indonesia, mayors of cities that is, and, and one from Thailand who shared on how they deal with the crises at their urban, at their city level. Um, I think there's probably much more I should say here, but but this this uh, webinar is also one further example of this civic engagement 4.0 initiative for dignity, justice, and sustainability. And I hope that some of you will be inspired to 
follow along to contribute uh, to participate in planning perhaps in in an uh, in a process that is a real um how do we say it's a real uh uh, uh a cauldron, a, a, a coming together of so many different minds and sharing experience experiences, and it's not at all top down. It's it's very much from the grassroots, but also from the heights of the university or the heights of city governance and so on. So again, I want to express my appreciation to Jalalongkorn University. Uh, I think that's what I need to say. Indrawan, anything further that needs to be said here? On you are muted. Indra, one you need thank, to. Thank you, Tep. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, very succinct overview of the entire process. And we have got so many encouraging uh, comments from the participants. But uh, now, please allow me to switch back to uh, Michiko Sar. Uh, because uh, she would probably have more to say about the book. And please, while waiting, turn to the next slide. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Indrawan and Ted. And uh, um, I'm very happy to be part of this process. And uh, in this slide, now we are showing uh, how you can access the, uh, the copy. Uh, the book can be ordered from All Ball Publishing House, which is the leading publisher in Indonesia for academic publications. The details are now indicated on this slide. Um, you can contact All Ball either by email or WhatsApp. Uh, technical facilitator is also showing the details in the chat box. Um, and then next slide, please. Yes, and in addition, uh, Chulalongkorn University is very pleased to offer up to 30 complimentary copies. Uh, so if you would like to participate in, in the random draw for a free copy of the book, please participate in the post-conference survey providing your contact information. The link is now shown in the chat box. And after the program today, uh, uh, you will hear from our technical facilitator uh, how to uh, how to register, I mean, the, to, to respond to the um, post-conference um, survey. Okay, thank you very much again. And uh, we now would like to invite all participants to join in taking a group photo. Over to you, Hermes. Thanks so much for your participation um, this morning as well. We hope that you continue to engage throughout today. So um, as Michigo said, we are going to go ahead and take a group photo. If you would like to participate, you can now turn on your video and we will take a photo in just a moment. If I may also ask Noelle to go ahead and put up the title screen so that we have that image beside us, that would be great. We'll just take a moment here to allow everyone who would like to participate in the group photo to turn on their cameras now. You should... Oh. Sorry about that. You can turn on your videos now. Thanks, Pratiksha. Fantastic. Okay, I'll give everyone another five seconds to turn on your cameras to participate in the group photo. So please turn on your cameras in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I will go ahead and take our first group photo here. So give us a big smile um, and I'll take the photo in three, two, one. Okay. And just in case someone else would like to join, um, go ahead and turn on your camera now and we'll take a photo again in three, two, one. Okay. Fantastic. Um, thank you everyone for uh, for participating in that group photo, we are going to be moving into a short 20 minute break now, and then we will get straight back into the program. So again, thank you for your participation and your interaction today, and we'll see you in 20 minutes.
everyone. We will now resume the program. Welcome back, everybody. Now we turn to the panel session of the conference. It is my pleasure to invite Dr. Toshiyuki Doi, academic advisor of the Institute of Asian Studies, Chulalongko University, and Dr. Yo Sengwan from Monash University to lead and facilitate the panel discussions. Toshi-san, Sengwan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michiko, and hello to Everyone, uh, welcome to the first panel discussion. My name is uh, Toshi, and I'm co-moderating uh, this panel and the, and the next one with my colleague, uh, Sengguang. Uh, Sengguang, would you like to say a word? Saudi Tong Mai, I pronounced that correctly since we're in Bangkok time. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Sengguang. I work in Monash University, Malaysia. That's my day job. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sure, thank you. Okay, so um, this and the next panels will uh, build on the uh, various issues uh, that have been brought up in the uh, in the previous uh, speeches, and but at the same time, we'd like to stick to this uh, overall uh, question of how civic engagement or uh, citizens' active participation can can promote uh, co-designing of resilient and uh, sustainable communities. Uh, locally, regionally, and, and globally uh, as well. Um, and of course, these communities will uh, respect, among other things, uh, justice and, and human dignity. That's the way uh, I see it. Um, and this first panel uh, provides uh, space to discuss these topics through the climate change or climate crisis lens. Okay, um, climate change or uh, climate crisis is a, is a clear case of ongoing global level crisis of unprecedented scale, as President uh, Bandit put it in his opening remarks. Um, and maybe another uh, example is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we are struggling with uh, these days in many parts of the world, uh, certainly Southeast Asia uh, or even the entire Asia. Uh, climate crisis is affecting us all, and it might be even related to the current uh, pandemic. Um, and I, I will say no more on this because I would like to uh, let this panel help us think through and discuss how we can actually deal with uh, climate crisis and, and other related issues. Um, I just want to say that uh, we'll probably get to hear a lot about uh, climate uh, change, climate crisis, and, and other related issues for the rest of the year, because, uh, uh, for, for example, I mean, we'll have uh, quite a few high-profile international events uh, for the coming month, with one example being uh, the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, or COP26 in short, uh, and this is coming up in Glasgow in October and, and November. So this year, particularly right now, is a good opportunity uh, for us to think about uh, climate change and, and crisis. Okay, so for this panel, we have four uh, panelists, all practitioners of civic engagement in, in various forms. And let me introduce them very uh, briefly. I start with the... Uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed Rifai from Kota Kita Foundation, Indonesia. Uh, Rifai, can I, can we see your face? Wave your hand so that everyone can recognize you. Hi, okay, everybody. thank you. Thank you, Rifai. All right. Uh, we also have Ms. Uh, Penchom Seitan from uh, Ecological Alert and Recovery Thailand, or also for short, 
uh, Penchom? Okay, that's Penchom. Thank you very much. Um, we also have Dr. Hesri Adnan from the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research. Uh, Hesri. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, last but not least, we are lucky to have someone from another continent uh, from a different time zone, Ms. Uh, Elodie Jacket from uh, Morris J. Was Center for Dialogue, Simon Fraser University, Canada. Hi, Elodie. Thank you so much for joining us. All right. So um, I am not going to um, give you a lengthy introduction of these speakers, because um, if you are interested in know more, knowing more about them and, and what they're doing, you can have access to their uh, profiles uh, through the link that you can see uh, in the chat box. All right. Um, and also, uh, many of uh, these panelists and also the next panel are also the authors of the, the book that uh, we just heard a lot about a uh, uh, while ago. Uh, so please order a copy right now or submit a, a survey and win a free, free copy. All right. Um, just to start uh, this panel, I like to ask uh, the four panelists very general questions, two questions. Okay. One is uh, uh, what civic engagement activity or activities uh, are you are you currently practicing? So this is by way of introducing yourself and, and your activity. And the second question is um, what challenges are you uh, facing uh, in your practicing of civic engagement uh, activity or activities? And how, how are you trying to um, overcome them? Okay. And I'll probably do this in Two, two rounds, okay? And the first round, I can probably start with the order that I uh, introduce uh, you. So starting from Rifai, uh, Penchom, Hezri, then LOD. And for the second question, for the second round, I can probably reverse the order and I can start with LOD, uh, then going back to Hezri, Penchom, Rifai, so you can be prepared. And for the participants, while you are uh, listening to uh, the panelists uh, speaking, uh, you can write your questions or comments in the chat box. Um, um, and uh, uh, also uh, live transcript is available if, if that um, helps you uh, following the panel. So uh, you, can, you can turn it on. And still, uh, I like to ask all the panelists to uh, speak in uh, audience friendly manners. Uh, as Ted put it, uh, we are coming from various uh, backgrounds uh, when it comes to English abilities. So let's make it uh, audience friendly as well. All right, so that's all I have to say. And uh, let me start with uh, Rifai. So please tell us uh, uh, what you're doing, but perhaps in, in, uh, in a few minutes, uh, three or four minutes. Thank you. Three minutes, Toshi. Oh my God. Yep, if you can. <laughs> okay, so, and, and we don't have a presentation, right? So I would basically uh, introduce first my organization. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, an executive director of Kota Kita Foundation. So this foundation was established in 2010, back uh, 12 years ago in Indonesia in, in Solo City. So Kota Kita is a a non-profit organization, non organization based in uh, Solo with expertise in urban planning and citizen participation in the design uh, and development of our cities. We bridge uh, dialogue between government and, uh, and the constituent by facilitating uh, citizen participation and collaboration, uh, influencing urban policies, encouraging open access to information and providing civic education to empower urban citizens. So currently our work focus on three uh, area, which is we call it as uh, urban governance, urban inclusivity, and urban resilience, which most related to climate change issue. Uh, by leveraging an inter interdisciplinary team and design driven approach to develop tools and methods, we strive a shared learning process between government and citizen for almost a decade now. And uh, our, our institution has worked in more than 20 cities in Indonesia in a range of projects 
from small scale urban intervention, citywide assessment, and large scale strategic planning and visioning with uh, uh, the government. We have led an organized number of events such as uh, annual urban social forum. Uh, you can visit also the website and a civil society led or uh, Indonesian forum that bring together uh, civil society practitioners and students that work toward uh, improving uh, our cities. Uh, just a quick snapshot to what we uh, are doing right now with uh, building uh, resilient cities and work uh, with communities as well in, in, a, in a various process of civic engagement. Kota Kita have a, a various project in engaging with the community. So for example, for many years, we've been conducting neighborhood level vulnerability assessment where we involve a group of community to kind of assess what type of vulnerable uh, uh, vulnerability in their community and then uh, use that kind of information to work uh, together with them to some kind of uh, make a profile and also make some kind of strategic a planning around what they can do with the community. So we have been working in Pekalongan, so for example, in small community called Pabian, and then also working in Sungai Jingah neighborhood in Banjarmasin uh, back uh, uh, to 2012 and 2010, uh, quite some time ago, but we still connected with them and doing a lot of kind of uh, a participatory process with them as well along the time. Also, we, we are working with uh, some kind of work on community-based neighborhood visioning that I just it's a follow-up as well from the process of this kind of mapping and assessment so we are doing a lot of kind of work in working with community to design community-based neighborhood uh, visioning we also working at the city level so for example at the city level we are working with the government and then also different stakeholders to uh, map out and make a city level also vulnerability assessment and identify possible uh, kind of uh, uh, what is kind of uh, participatory and collaborative action that we can do together in the city level. We, we, we also develop a sector based resilient strategy with our governments at the, at the city level. So for example, we are working in Semarang uh, and, and the issue of water as leverage and creating a roadmap of implementation of water as leverage initiative and also working together with three city right now in Bima, Pontianak and Manado to do some kind of urban flood uh, resilience diagnostic, di diagnostic process. We also work in the development of guidelines to improve a city and community resilience. So we are promoting right now a lot of kind of kampung resilient project where we promote a uh, kind of a process where community can develop their own kind of, uh, you know, uh, adaptation uh, project uh, and, and plan together with wider stakeholders to, to work together on that. Uh, so for example, like that. So, so for example, currently we are working with uh, a, a different kampung in Solo to create more uh, kind of a green, and accessible uh, public spaces in the neighborhood, improving uh, uh, different uh, infrastructure project with community in regard and respond to, to the, the impact of climate change in, in different cities. I think that that's pretty much my introduction. I think we can elaborate a little more. Thank you, Tashi. Thank you, Rifai. You have already elaborated a lot and I understand that the, uh, your organization already has a decade of a uh, very uh, rich experience of uh, uh, civic engagement. And of course, you know, we can learn a lot. I mean, because, because your work is so community-based, how you can continue to work with local communities uh, in, uh, um, in this uh, pandemic. I, I think uh, that will probably come up in the, in the next round. So I move to uh, Penchong. Uh, can you introduce uh, your work, please? Yes, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, uh, my name is Pen Chom, uh, Director of uh, Ecological Alert and Recovery. Uh, the former name of uh, Earth uh, is Campaign for Alternative Industrial Network, or CAN. Uh, we, we used the name CAN for about 10 years. Uh, CAN was set up in 1998 uh, to carry off uh, lots of activities in supporting the communities uh, uh, living in neighbor, uh, neighboring with uh, factories. 
uh, particular in the eastern regions of Thailand and some other provinces in 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 uh, in the nation. Uh, the first project that we set up uh, after we set up the organization is Industrial Pollution Watch. Under the Industrial Pollution Watch, uh, we carrying uh, we carried out uh, several types of activities, including conducting some research and uh, taking some uh, environmental sample to prove uh, the contaminant in the air uh, in Maptaput area. Maptaput is the name of the largest uh, petroleum and petrochemical development uh, area or the, uh, the largest uh, industrial hotspot of Thailand. Uh, we uh, form uh, the organization uh, in order to promote the, the public participation uh, and the right to know of uh, Thai publics to access particularly the industrial pollution information or other uh, related environmental uh, in, uh, information. Uh, since Thailand has uh, strongly promoted industrialization for more than uh, 30 years ago, and uh, the government uh, did not uh, carry the policy in balance, so many communities in, in the rural area uh, badly are impacted uh, by industrial pollution. And uh, there have been uh, serious human rights violations happening in those areas. So this is one of the, the objectives uh, the objective that why we have to uh, organize ourselves to support uh, community in, in those areas. And then, uh, we co uh, conduct uh, a number of uh, research uh, like uh, to study about the uh, uh, environmental impact and health impact uh, in, in, the, in, in those uh, industrial hotspots like in Layong province and uh, Chai Cheng South province. The, un under the project of the Thai government economic growth promotion, uh, which uh, formerly called Eastern Seaboard. Uh, area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, moving on uh, study about the uh, uh, loss of uh, government policies like uh, city planning in those industrial zones, uh, try to investigate and to advocate for uh, the government to give importance about the city planning particularly like uh, to, to have the buffer zone or protection strip between the uh, communities who live in very close to the uh, factories or industrial development area. This is part of uh, what we have focused on. And then uh, we try to find out uh, what, uh, the big, what are the big concerns of the community uh, in the petrochemical development area, like the air pollution. Uh, after we set up cane, we, 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 we almost uh, never know about uh, what the uh, scientific technique to follow up or to monitor the uh, environmental impact and the chemicals contaminated in the air uh, that the people uh, have to breathe in every day. So we have contact and work together with the Greenpeace in Thailand and some other uh, international organization for uh, training to build up the capacity for uh, our group and for the community that we have been working with. Uh, this is the, the first step that uh, bringing us to know about the citizen science. Uh, we found out that uh, citizen science uh, is very important to prove uh, to have to conduct the scientific scientific proof uh, in uh, industrial uh, impact area, and we can use uh, th those information or the study uh, to start negotiating with the polluter and the government uh, with the aim uh, to bring up uh, some uh, inform uh, some solution. Uh, for the people in 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 the in in the in the, in the area, when we study about the citizen science, uh, we have to start uh, citizen science for several years before we set up uh, 
the citizen science project. But before that, uh, we changed from Cain to Earth in 2009. Uh, after uh, I received, uh, uh, I was granted uh, uh, API or uh, Asian Public Intelligence uh, Fellowship. Uh, I learned a lot in Minamata City and in uh, many other cities in Japan. Learned about the citizen movement in Japan and a collaboration between the lawyer, academic, and communities in, in those uh, industrial pollution heat area in Japan. And then when I came back from Japan, I set up uh, ecolo Ecological Alert and Recovery, changed the name of Kane to Earth, and uh, register uh, as a foundation, and start uh, build up a, a citizen science project and uh, uh, like a, try to experiment uh, lots of uh, scientific uh, proofing in, in industrial area to uh, uh, provide uh, the better support to community uh, who have been uh, impacted by chemicals, uh, uh, toxic chemicals or uh, like the air pollution and water pollution. So uh, we conduct uh, several types of activity related to uh, citizen science in, in, in Layong province to prove uh, contaminants in the air that people live in. We prove uh, like uh, the heavy metal contamination in the soil or uh, in the farmland uh, that are close or being impacted by the coal mining in the province in the, in the northeastern region of Thailand. And we also support uh, several communities who have been affected by uh, illegal dumping of uh, hazardous industrial waste in Chacheng South province, in Bajinburi province, uh, and gather this evidence and start negotiating with uh, the polluters and the local government uh, with some uh, public pressures uh, uh, that uh, could bring the uh, like a negotiation or uh, start dialogue with uh, Thai party committee uh, to, to, to solve the uh, contamination in, in those areas. So this is part of the, the activity that uh, I, have, I have worked with uh, my team in many provinces. And so far, we still expand uh, our support to several areas of, of Thailand under the name of the Citizen Science Project. Yeah. Thank you, Penchom. Uh, another yeah, a report of long-standing efforts to uh, connect uh, local communities in Thailand uh, to uh, uh, make uh, favorable changes at, at the policy uh, levels, including uh, city planning, uh, and uh, uh, as you probably, as everyone probably uh, um, heard, uh, citizen science uh, can be a key term, and we can probably learn uh, a bit more about it uh, in the coming round. Thank you, Penchom, and I move to uh, Esri. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, you're you're on mute, Esri. Thank you, Dr. Toshi and uh, Dr. Sengwan. Uh, greetings of peace, greetings of solidarity. Uh, I am Hezri Atnan, currently um, heading the um, uh, one of Malaysia's um, oldest economic think tank, the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research. But uh, I'm not going to say much about that uh, because it is still new, but I'm going to reflect on two, uh, perhaps one initiative first, which I was involved in since 2015. And then perhaps say a couple of words about uh, an, a new initiative which I'm involved in um, to connect the digital space and also the sustainability space. Uh, the first thing is um, the uh, around 2015. In fact, right after the, uh, in fact, as the uh, you know the international negotiations on, on uh, you know uh, um, sustainable development goals were were progressing, um, I. And another, myself and another uh, public intellectual, well-known public intellectual in Malaysia, we organized something called the Civil Society Alliance 
for sustainable development goals. And uh, um, I mainly come from the environmental movement, if you like, and my colleague, Dr. Dr. Denison Jayasurya, he's, uh, he's, he works mainly in the human rights and also uh, um, social work domain. So we came together as a team and started to bring the different groups under one umbrella. So, uh, you know, it was the very first time in, in our history that the environment group uh, and, and the land rights group come together with the women uh, group, uh, human rights group, and a host of other uh, issues. So that platform was, was meant to be a, um, in a sort of a, a loose network of uh, NGOs, and that has progressed over the years. And um, in a couple of years' time, we managed to bring in 40, over 40 NGOs under this umbrella, and we worked within you know, uh, just a loose setup but eventually, around 2018, when Malaysia, um, after the general election in Malaysia, when a new government was ushered in, we managed to convince the Speaker of uh, Malaysian Parliament to uh, kickstart a, a, a new sort of a group called the All Party Parliamentary Groups, uh, or APP GM, All Party Parliamentary Groups Malaysia, on SDGs. There are three APP GMs that were established at that time. One was on uh, refugees, the other one was in prison detention um, and care reform. And the other one is what we, what we started with, which is the sustainable development goals. So uh, we managed to put SDGs for sustainability on par with other key concerns in you know, key public policy concerns in Malaysia. And this uh, APPGM platform is actually funded by the government. Of course, there's some limitation there, but. Uh, what has been uh, happening in the past few years is that um, this group uh, has uh, gone to interact with member of parliament. So it was the very first time that you know, a big group of NGOs um, learned to work with member of parliaments on the ground and with the funding that we got from the government, the, uh, um, we identified projects, social projects on the ground. Uh, some is not much about 20,000 ringgit per project, but that was enough to sort of a map what are the existing concerns on the ground. And so this is one initiative to localize sustainable development goals. So that, that is one initiative. Uh, the other initiative, which I will spend the next one minute talking about is the uh, something which I'm about to start with a private sector entity, uh, which is uh, something called a dialogue hub on water, food, energy nexus. As we know, and then this relates to the uh, session that we are, that we are in today, Climate change is a, a, a sort of a, a you know, a, a stressor, you know, a, a exacerbator of stress, yeah? So uh, what we are already facing in, in, in the whole world is that, uh, as we know, if I can give some figures, um, in, 20, in 2050, we're expecting to have about 9.4 billion people living on the planet. Now we have about 7.9 billion people, and then, to, to feed this uh, additional 2 billion people, we need to produce anywhere from 60 to 70% more food. And similarly, uh, we need to produce about 40% energy. This is a global picture by 2050 to, you know, to power our gadgets, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, the challenge is that by 2030, we are expecting to face a global water deficit. So it's 20 years before, you know, so SSDG is 2030, but 20 will also be facing with water deficit. And uh, we know for a fact that we need water to produce energy, we need water to produce food, and then we have this climate change as a, as a stress or multiplier. Uh, how are we gonna manage in, in the futures to come, you know, in the years to come? So we're gonna establish this dialogue hub on water, food, and in excess to identify what are the local solutions uh, on the ground uh, that can be uh, sort of advanced with the help of, uh, you know, digital uh, or, or new technologies. And this is where I'm bringing in uh, private sector interest to work with uh, you know, the, uh, the existing sectoral players on water, food, and energy, and also to bring in the, uh, the local voices. And what are, the, what are the challenges and how can we solve this with new technologies? I just would like to stop short here, stop here first, uh, Dr. Toshi, and, and uh, relate to some of the challenges later. Thank you. Thank you, Hesri. That was uh, great. Uh, another report about covering uh, uh, other uh, actors and sectors, such as the parliament and also uh, the private sector. Uh, I'm particularly glad, Hesri, that you uh, brought up the issues about uh, digital and, and new technology. And we certainly need to uh, 
uh, ensure that uh, everyone has enough uh, you know access to uh, food water uh, and energy uh, because that is uh, directly related to justice and dignity issues so we will learn a lot more about uh, uh, your experiences later on so let's move on to uh, uh, melody thank you for waiting it's your turn thank you toshi san thank you sang wan for having me um selamat pagi I hope everybody is feeling good in Southeast Asia. It is nighttime here in Canada, so I'm very glad to be with you today. So I'm part of the Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University, and we are a think and do tank. So um, sort of a, a, a weird entity within a university. There are not many academics among us. We're mostly practitioners uh, and with a specific interest in dialogue. So we work with all levels of government on designing, uh, implementing, and reporting on participatory civic engagement initiatives. Um, again, focusing on issues that are important to society, from justice to housing to climate. Uh, we also um, have a semester for undergraduate students at the university here focused on the practice of dialogue and civic engagement, and it's an experiential um, semester that our students really appreciate. And then my department uh, focuses on understanding methodologies of dialogue and public participation and convening groups of uh, like-minded people to have discussions on how we can push this practice forward and how to convince particularly governments and decision makers that this is an important piece of the puzzle. So we recently launched an international climate engagement network and uh, many of the people at this conference today, including uh, Rifai, uh, Ted, um, Inhawan have been now um, brought into this network to share their expertise. So we're very pleased with that. Um, we're also just about to launch a pilot project with some cities here in Canada looking at whole of system approaches to get to net zero by 2050. And uh, this is mandated by the new law that was passed in Canada that has now new um, emissions reductions objectives that need to be met in order to meet our commitments for the Paris Agreement. So with that in mind, we're going to be working with a number of cities on doing um, sort of modular ways of doing civic engagement. So including citizens assemblies, uh, roundtables with different actors from civil society, and then working very deeply within communities to make sure that the voices of those most affected by climate change are put at the forefront. Uh, often those are the voices that are not being heard uh, in public participation exercises. So we're looking at how do we bring together the ideas of climate justice with climate adaptation and mitigation and how we ensure that the voices of communities are heard and that the solutions that are in communities are also brought forward. Um, we try not to work in a binary way where it is uh, an opposition between uh, economics and environment, but really looking at the wisdom that a lot of communities have in terms of dealing with these big issues. Uh, so lots of focus on storytelling, on sharing and uh, building up the capacity of different communities to create their own solutions. Because as I think our esteemed colleagues said earlier, uh, governments alone do not have uh, the solutions to this big problem, uh, but communities do have a lot of the options already there. So it's about building on that wisdom and uh, getting it to the next step where we can scale up all these different uh, solutions to the point where we can effectively tackle climate change. I will stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elodie. Uh, we have just heard uh, another uh, way of uh, getting local communities uh, involved. Uh, as I understand, a slightly different uh, uh, level or, or, or layer. Uh, I'd be particularly interested in this modular uh, ways approach, um, how to get communities actively involved uh, uh, in uh, uh, various activities through storytelling uh, and local wisdom. That sounds very exciting. So 
uh, let's do another round and I should probably ask you to uh, highlight just one or two uh, challenges because I'd like to make sure that, that we have time for discussion and, and questions and answers. So just limit yourself to one or two you know, challenges that you're facing and how you try to overcome them um, partic with particular emphasis on, on climate change, uh, climate crisis issues, all right? And if you can uh, make it short and concise, I would appreciate it. So let me start with Elodie this time. Are you ready? Yes, Great. thank you. Yeah, the floor is yours. So I think the first challenge, and my colleagues will probably agree with me, is how to convince uh, decision makers and governments in particular of the importance of the voices of citizens and communities in tackling the challenge of climate change. Uh, oftentimes there is a disconnect between government and citizens. And making the case for civic participation is very hard and we found it quite challenging. But uh, I think there's some good news on the horizon from um, recent experiences around the world with different citizens assembly, the global assembly that will happen in the lead up to COP26, for example, we're seeing governments more and more interested in this way of approaching a problem that they alone cannot solve. But I think there is a case to be made for more books like the one we were presented today to be shared and more of us practitioners really uh, coming together to showcase how this can be done and uh, really talk about the risks of not engaging citizens on this important question. Uh, so I think there's more risks in not engaging than in engaging. So it's about making the case for that balance. The second challenge that I see with climate change is that it's a systemic issue. It's not an issue that can be tackled easily through just uh, techno-economic means. It cannot just be tackled with um, behavioral change with citizens, but it's a combination of things that need to be brought together. So when we think about uh, civic engagement, we must also think in that systemic way. So I'm a recovering biologist myself, so I tend to see everything in systems and in uh, how they interact and work with each other. So as we think about civic engagement, this is the case I want to make that all these things can and must work together, um, whether it's hyper-local civic engagement in small communities or nationwide dialogues or international dialogues. Um, they have to work together. They have to communicate with each other. So I think one of the challenges we face is when we work in small communities is bringing that information back to larger subnational or national or international processes and making sure that the, those voices don't get um, averaged out in the end but that the particularities of different communities are highlighted and respected for what they can bring to the table. So again, I will stop there to hear from my esteemed colleagues here. Thank you very much. And I uh, thank you particularly to make a nice link between uh, uh, your speech and, and uh, the book that we uh, launched. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let's move on to Hezri. Are you ready? Thanks, uh, Dr. Toshi. Uh, well, the, the challenges, of course, there are many challenges as, uh, you know, the problem we are facing, uh, they are, you know, what we call wicked problems, you know, they are not linear challenges. And there are multiple wicked problems that we have to, have to address at the same time even now, especially with the, uh, you know, the uh, coming of COVID-19. Uh, but what, what is uh, the, uh, I mentioned two initiatives before this. And uh, what was I was trying to address was the issue of, or challenge of silo. You know, we often speak about silo in government, but uh, lo and behold, there's also silo in civil society. We work at different scales. We work at, you know, on different issues. How do we bring the different people together? So that was the, uh, what uh, we, you know, the, the uh, establishment of the CSO Alliance for Sustainable Development Goals, which later graduated to becoming, you know, a, a, a the all party uh, platform for all party parliamentary group. Those was to address that challenge. And of course, the, um, the uh, the other the other issue related to the you know uh, dealing with climate change and all this is that the imbalance of power I mentioned three sectors just now water food and energy uh, then of course uh, you know uh, water is uh, first among equal in this sort of holy trinity but 
when it comes to the um, uh, ability to, you know, how the industry is, is uh, organized, the energy sector is the most organized. And in fact, in Malaysia, uh, water is not visible in the economy at all. And that has created a lot of problems. And in fact, uh, because of our federal state uh, structure, uh, you know, we cannot even secure the space where the water flows, which is a river, because the river is a state issue. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, power dynamics there. So we, we are creating this hub so that we can break this, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the imbalance of power and identify a, a transition, sort of a transition strategy. How are we going to deal with this as we move along? And of course, with the transition plan, we, we also have to be very uh, tactful when dealing with the, um, you know, the winners and losers. How do you incentivize or disincentivize these players? So those are the challenges. And, and the other thing is that uh, many of the solutions on the ground are actually, you know, of course, small scale. And the challenge is that we need the dynamism of the private sector. This is perhaps where, you know, civil, some civil society players might not be too comfortable to bring in the, the, the dynamism of the public sector or the dynamism of the uh, you know, capital uh, uh, sector, you know. So, so uh, scaling up would require uh, the coming together of the different knowledge cultures, different specializations that, um, that will be the challenge of our time, I think. And uh, th those are the three challenges, Dr. Toshi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hezri. Uh, yeah, I'm beginning to see some uh, common concerns uh, across your, your interventions. Uh, for example, this silo uh, issue, I think is related to uh, uh, the systematic uh, view of uh, creating changes as, as Elodie uh, pointed out. Um, and also how we can boost up, uh, you know, uh, grounded innovations uh, up to the policy and, and wider levels. And, and we definitely need uh, you know, uh, helps and involvement uh, from other sectors like the private sector, you said, and definitely uh, the government and whatnot. So we're seeing some commonalities here. And uh, let's move on to Penchom. Uh, please highlight one or two challenges uh, uh, with focus on uh, climate change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Toshi. Uh, I would like to highlight maybe three levels, uh, three levels of uh, the challenges that I see uh, regarding to the climate change. The first, the first level is about the uh, at the policy making uh, decision, decision level, which I my concern is uh, how we can build up or advocate for more transparency at the policy making level. Like uh, in particular in Thailand, uh, this is the big problem right now, and. Uh, uh, citizen cannot uh, access lots of information uh, at the policy making level and uh, like a uh, lots of problem in environmental problem or a lot of impact happening from economic growth and industrializations caused by the intransparencies uh, at this level. So this is, I think this is basically very important uh, to move on uh, to protect uh, our world from uh, climate impact. Then uh, I think it is about uh, how we can uh, call for more responsibility of the private sector or the uh, industrial production sector. Uh, the industrial production se sector, for example, they consume a lot of uh, coal. Uh, they need a lot of power and electricity that uh, to for, for the production process. And uh, they use a lot of uh, uh, fossil fuel, like particularly the coal in many factories. So uh, in Thailand, uh, we need to change this type of policy. However, uh, the, in uh, the initiative from the private sector is very important to respond on, on this issue. Uh, I think in Thailand, uh, the private sector is very uh, consumed and very happy about uh, privilege they see from the governments, and they totally ignore responsibility to the uh, hazard or disaster happening to environment and uh, society in general. So uh, we need to call for more responsibility from the private sector. The last, the last one is uh, how we can uh, communicate or build up uh, alertness and awareness, more awareness of general public. Uh, 
uh, the law of general public uh, is very important, basically important to, to support the citizen movement or a civil society in advocating for uh, more responsible uh, policy, both from the government and from private sector. And it is also very important for general public that they, they have to to, uh, to alert and have more concerns about the serious impact of the climate change because they need to uh, prepare themselves. They need to uh, alert for the, uh, adapt themselves for any, any, any types of change or damage or the impact that may caused by the change of the climate. So this is my basic uh, level that, three basic level that it is, I think it is important for the climate change issue. Thank you. Thank you, Penchon. And uh, I move to uh, Rifai. Um, sorry, we cannot uh, show your slides, uh, Rifai, but we can distribute them after the conference. So can you, can you still talk without the slides? Yep. Yep. It's Sorry, okay. I'd appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, because uh, I, I I have uh, many picture here to show, but but it's okay. I can tell the, the story a little bit, the context of the issue and the challenge in Indonesia. Since uh, in relating to climate change, Indonesia is a, a very archipelago kind of country with home to many coastal cities, and we are under the threat of the climate change, urban crowd, and institutional challenge as well. Uh, so, for example, like a city like like Samarang, so for example, in a, in a, in, a, in a central Java, it's a it's a very prone to kind of flood from the close coastal area, and then also at the same time have a landslide issue in some part of the city in the hilly side. Also, drought, access to clean water, also extreme heat. At the same time, also with the growth of the city, land subsidence is also up up apparent in the city like Samarang. So. Uh, actually, uh, like like you know, if, if you if you go to Samarang, like uh, tidal flood, it's like everyday kind of you know uh, 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 everyday kind of experience that the, the, the most of the, the people there facing. And the the second issue that I want to raise in the challenge in Indonesian cities, but basically the knowledge gap, uh, the the knowledge gap on a climate change and how it can affect the city in the future. What I mean by the knowledge gap is that there is there is still many kind of in, in the society level and the community level there has been an awareness about what, what, what is going on with our world in related to climate change. We, we, we really many many times we can see that the community is still very ignorant in throwing their trash to the rivers and the many cities in Indonesia like we work in Banjarmasin, we work in many cities in Borneo and they still see that throwing trash to a river is something useful because they believe that the river can, can consume that trash and over kind of, you know, recycle that trash, something like that. So the gap is still very kind of something that we have to really work with. Him. At the same time, under resource city, high dependent on national government leads to top-down planning and little participation from the local government, especially local government, especially in impacted communities. So I mean, like, it's, 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 it's a very common that very uh, city have, have a really uh, difficulty in access funding or, or consolidate kind of financing scheme to kind of address climate change, which is we, we, it's, it's, a, it's a common uh, kind of issues facing by small scale, medium sized city with, with uh, limited resources. Also communities experience the impact of climate change, but yet uh, they are not empowered yet to address a larger phenomenon. I think this, this is also crucial where community was actually, I, I mean, like the, the uh, experiencing the direct impact of the climate change, but but working together with this community are still very rare in in, in, the, in the current practices. So that's why Kota Kita also pretty much kind of focus on how to promote this kind of model of participation by local community to uh, 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 enhance and uh, encourage more kind of uh, community based. Uh, 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 mitigation and adaptation for climate change. Thank you. Maybe that's that, that that's it. So maybe we can discuss later. Okay. Thank you. Great, Rifai. Thank you. And sorry again about not being able to um, use your slides, but uh, uh, the participant will certainly appreciate your pictures, so we can share them later. Uh, my co-moderator Sengwan, uh, are we having any incoming questions? 
or, or do you have any questions? You, you, you did announce that right, their questions uh, have to be posted on chat, right, Toshi? Did yeah, I, well, I, I thought I did. Oh, so but, I, I don't see any questions on chat okay. at all. So maybe we just open it up now, people to think a bit and to write sure, in sure. the questions and I will gather them. Yeah, yeah that would be great. So uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, open the floor to uh, to the participants. And if you have any questions, you can either write them. I, I thought I had encouraged uh, you into doing it, but if I didn't, sorry, but you can write them in the chat box. So if you don't mind uh, speaking up, we can unlock you so that you can actually uh, voice your comments or questions. Does anyone have any question? Uh, Ted, are you are going to speak up? Okay, Ted, go ahead, please. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, I I listened to uh, a I listened to a U.S. kind of grassroots uh, TV broadcast called Democracy Now, and uh, they cover climate uh, news a lot. And actually, what's happening right now is really astounding. Forest fires, floods, once in a thousand year events of many, many kinds. And I'm, I'm curious whether any of you would like to comment on, do you feel that this is changing your, your work or the potential for reaching people? Because it's, it's really dramatic and uh, in, in my view, how much is happening and even scientists are saying, Oh, all the worst possibilities beyond our models seem to be happening. Just, just a general question. Okay. Uh, anybody would like to take it up and respond? Okay. Hello, D, please. Uh, thank you, Ted. And I'm glad that you brought this up because I'm very close to a community that just got devastated by the forest fires. We had a village here called Lytton that was completely burned down a few weeks ago. Um, the biggest change that I've seen in our work is uh, the demand that citizens are now making uh, towards government to, to be more active, that uh, the status quo is no longer acceptable. And I think um, what has been interesting is discussions with civil society uh, participants and leaders, for example, of unions, um, who for a long time government would say, oh, we cannot close down uh, fossil fuel extraction because of course there are many workers in that domain. And if we shut it down, these workers will no longer have jobs. But now we're hearing from the unions of these workers that they actually want to transition to clean energy energy jobs. They no longer want to be involved in industries that create climate change and that really make some communities disappear uh, through either flooding or forest fires. Um, so it's it's been an interesting shift to see that the, um, the momentum is actually coming from the bottom up. I would say civil society is doing a really heavy push right now for stronger action both on parts of the government, but also from other actors in society. So I think we're going to see spaces for more dialogue and uh, more uh, collaboration and cooperation for concrete action. So it gives me a lot of hope. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel? No response? Oh, she, if okay, I can... Ah, yeah. yes. Let's uh, see, uh, Rifai and uh, Hezri, okay, in the order then. Yeah, Rifai, you go first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted, for your comment. And, and, and basically, this is also the concerns in, 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 in our work right now. We are really kind of facing the, the, the changing world, which is, which is we, we feel it. We, it's very close to us. It's, it's, uh, it's every day, you know, it's Indonesia now, it just started the dry season, which is quite prolonged rainy season for for, for kind of you know this 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 time and it's really hot right now as well but 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 what is important now how we can also bring this kind of 
a phenomenon be, be kind of transfer and explain to our community in in rather simple way not to be complicated like scientific way but it must be be able to to translate this to their the daily life because because it's tricky in, in a sense in our experience working with community they, they don't really kind of make sense of this kind of uh scientific knowledge but they want to understand an easy way why this happened and stuff like that what why it's not good to throw trash to the river why uh, it's 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 really important to take care of your water to not consume too much right now in the time of the crisis right now stuff like that is pretty much like really important homework for for civil society like like us to work to the community uh to work with community and and be kind of uh avant-garde kind of uh, uh movement to kind of you know uh, sound and and make this kind of uh, uh issues around climate change become their concern this is this is really important right now for for for, for Takita especially and working in the ground. Thank, Thank you, you Lefi and uh, Hezri. Next, yes, I I just like to echo the two interventions before that uh, the the policy window is now is is very widely open, and uh, it is it is uh, incumbent upon us now in the civil society and the civic engagement space to uh, provide that, uh, you know, to extend our hand, you know, to, because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, people are very open to, to solutions now. So we have to step up, you know, and uh, this is, uh, you know, what, you know, what has happening in, in, in Europe, for instance, is supercharged storm and all that. And we are seeing this everywhere. And in fact, um, uh, you know, even, even the unthinkable responses are already happening. I was on a panel with a bunch of uh, energy specialists from the US. They're saying that, you know, in the U.S., you have to be uh, to be an environmentalist. You have to be you have to oppose um, hydropower dams. But now the environmentalists are talking, are working in 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 you know in partnership with the hydropower dam people. You know, so because you need solutions, now. you need all kinds of solutions to address what we're facing now. Thank you. Okay, uh, Toshi. So there are now questions. Uh, first, yes. from Patricia, uh, she just raised her hand, but she didn't put in the question, so she has to be invited to unmute and speak. Yeah. Can we unmute her? Yeah, I, I also her uh, raising hand. Ms. Uh, uh, Pratik, Pratiksha, can you now speak up? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Go ahead. Very lovely to have uh, to hear all of you. Um, I'm currently based in Bangkok and so um, really very much in the region, working in this region. Our region isn't maybe particularly most well known for its gender equity um, in, in a lot of this work. And so I'm really curious in your experiences, how is that really being not bolted on, but baked in? And how are we really working um, to not also always frame women and, and youth as marginalized vulnerable communities, but also those with a lot of um, profound knowledge agency and how are we cultivating that in your work? Um, and how are, we, how are we, yeah, shifting some of those power dynamics? I really feel quite strongly about this. Very, very curious to hear about your, your opinions and, and your um, perspectives and how you're engaging this in your work. I also have a second question, if that's okay, to Elodie. And um, in particular, Elodie, you spoke about, um, you know, really uh, not letting voices average out when they're brought to the fore and mixed with others. And really, uh, the risk of not engaging is greater than the risk of engaging and all that fallout that might happen. I'm really wondering if you could share ways in which you're going to those communities and getting that buy-in. How does that take place? Funders don't fund for trust, and that takes time. And so can you speak a little bit about that um, for all of us who are working through organizations in different communities in the region? Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so the first question, um, uh, well, in, in my own words, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm very glad that you, you know, raised that issue. So looking at uh, uh, women and, and youth in particular, not necessarily as vulnerable groups, but uh, uh, considering them as agents for, for change and how, how, and how we can uh, get them uh, involved more, more actively. Uh, anybody would like to uh, respond? It's a very critical issue. Ashi, can I? Yes, uh, who is this, Rifai? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
I just want to share experience on, on most of our work that uh, women and youth role is really significant in, in Indonesian society, especially in, in the context of that. Uh, usually it's a very feudalistic kind of uh, and paternalistic uh, kind of pattern of society, but we really understand that it has certain kind of powerful kind of you know, assets of, of women in, in the community in supporting most of our works in, in, in working with, with our community in tackling climate change, for example. In our work mostly in urban farming, so for example, with community, with uh, ur uh, urban poor, uh, in an urban poor setting. Uh, women's role are really important in organizing uh, kind of, you know, like uh, other women to kind of, you know, involve in taking care of like plantings and cultivating kind of, you know, vegetable around their homes and neighborhoods, stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty, in, 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 in our current experience in Solo, in one of the kampungs, for example, our, our people work with association of women called PKK. PKK in Indonesia is very common. It's a very strong organization in each of the neighborhood. We call it like as a PKK and they're very strong in organizing women how mobilize them to kind of work together to tackle the issues of, of, of you know climate change. So for example, uh, making uh, very green kind of uh, uh, kind of movement. I I have a picture in my slide showing that most of the people working in our engagement uh, and regarding of like urban agriculture and urban farming, they are women. Most of the women. Also in data collection, you know, in our experience in data collection, women are number one kind of entity, women association as well, number one entity who know exactly what's going on in their neighborhood. In Indonesian culture, women chat each other very often so they can transfer information really easy in the ground. So for example, they know exactly how many kids you never have, how many kids are out of the school, how many public toilets in your neighborhood. They know exactly. So when we collect data, they help. It's really, really kind of powerful. They, they're really kind of, you know, powerful women uh, be able to kind of contribute to, to the process of this kind of transformation, you know, so, something that we experience in the ground. Thank you, just sharing from our experience. Okay, uh, there are more questions, but let me do a time check first because I'm in Malaysian time. It's now 1.05 in Malaysia. What time is it in Thailand? Is it 12 o'clock already? Uh, yeah, about 12. And I think we have 15 to 20 more minutes for this panel. Oh, it's been extended. All right. So, yeah. Little bit. Yeah. And uh, let, let me uh, uh, give the microphone to Elodie because uh, she's got a question addressed to her. So, go ahead, Elodie. Thank and you. of course, if you, if, you can, if you can respond to the first question as well. Okay, so I will do my best to keep it short, but uh, so first on the question of women and youth, I think the interesting thing, discussion that I've had with government officials recently is stop treating them as a separate group. Uh, women and youth are a huge part of our societies, and if we stop treating them as a marginalized group, but as an active part of our society, it works a lot better. Uh, to give you an example, recently we worked with the province of British Columbia, where I'm based, on um, climate, their climate action uh, legislation. And they did um, community consultation and engagement, and we encouraged them to have a youth specific group. And at first they were a little bit reluctant, but when they did, uh, a lot of very interesting proposals came from the youth. Uh, so I think really giving more space for youth to talk to officials is interesting because they are also the ones facing the most impacts at the end of the day. Um, you know, you and I may be retired in a few years, but they will still be facing the brunt of this. So I think making sure their voices are at the front is really important. Um, I work with a lot of indigenous communities here in Canada, and they have an approach that's called seven generations before seven generations after. So we need to hear from elders, and we need to hear from young people. And we cannot plan anything unless those generations are brought into the discussion for any major decision we make. So I think that's a very interesting approach to have. Um, on averaging out and avoiding averaging out, um, there is a little tool that governments now use here in Canada that's called a Gender-Based Analysis Plus. And it's a framework that allows to bring in intersectionality in any 
public policy development and public policy engagement that is being done. And it demands that practitioners uh, look at their assumptions they make, that we take a very good look at the internal diversity of different communities. So instead of putting people in small boxes, you know, women, the young people, um, the workers, that we look at the internal diversity of each of those groups and make sure that diversity is reflected through the engagement work and through the data that is being collected. Because we know uh, intersecting identities mean different experiences, especially when it comes to climate change. If you're um, a disabled person, for example, your ability to adapt to climate change may be very different from somebody who's able-bodied even if we share the same um, degree of education. So it's looking at that, that level of nuance that's really important. And one of the ways in which uh, we found that to be easy to do is to collect stories and make sure those stories are woven into reports. So it's not just um, quantitative data, but you have the quality and the contextual information to go with it. And that is brought in through stories. And I'm sure uh, Rifai will have a lot of that in, in his own practice as well, uh, really focusing on those stories to bring context to the data that we present. So that's one way of doing it, but I'm sure there are many others. Okay, so in the interest of time, there are about four questions, but I can sort of into, uh, sort of synthesize those questions together, right? Yeah, and I think some yeah. of those questions are already uh, already well answered by some of the re most recent exchange. All right, so it's about from Sue. Do you have some successful strategies for harnessing engagement in an interdisciplinary manner, which can be tied to Indra one's question? What is the recipe for local communities buy-in and vision building, uh, which can also be bought in, uh, can be also be tied in by Resi's question. Uh, question is how to organize the best, how to decide on the best organizational model for for his project in Central Java. So I think apart from telling, uh, asking you or requesting you to buy our book, the answers are, might be there already. Uh, so any of you want to attempt <laughs> uh, to do that? And in other words, what's the recipe for engagement? In a, in a, well, I think uh, Ilodi introduced the word intersectional approach, uh, whereas you use the word interdisciplinary approach. Yeah, okay. Yeah, over to you, Toshi, to direct, to track. Yeah, anybody uh, would like to respond? Success strategies, uh, recipes uh, to further civic engagement. Bifai, are you going to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I mean, to answer that, I think we really have to be kind of uh, be able to identify what type of engagement, I mean, like what level of engagement, I mean, like we have experience that we engage with different stakeholders, Right, it, it can be in a very grassroots community in the ground, it can be with the government, it can be with high level national kind of policy maker. It is just a very, very uh, uh, have a different context in terms of your successful engagement. I think understanding the, 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 the your, your stakeholder is really important, especially our experience in the ground says, for example, if you can kind of uh, uh, be a role of facilitator in particular engagement, in the ground, you have to be really able to make it some sort of kind of process that it's fun uh, and then engaging, and it's not like a burdening, you know, something like that. So it's really something that our focus is uh, creating a useful and engaging tool that 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 the community can can really be able to kind of involve in a meaningful way. That's something that we really, we really focusing. So be creative and then be kind of, you know, uh, uh, as innovative as possible, especially in, in, in promoting more kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, res respectful to the, to the local community. That's something that, that may be really crucial to, to maintain your uh, 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 engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any, uh, yeah. Hello, D, please. So there, there is a practice I teach my students and I call it the 100 cups of tea because I'm a big tea drinker. Uh, to build that trust with communities, you have to be able to be patient and to build the relationships. 
And one of the ways you do that, I think uh, our colleague Hesri talked about it, is breaking the silos. How can you work in partnership with stakeholders in those communities? Like Nifai just said, you know, identifying who those key people who can open the door for you, uh, who can help you find out who you need to have tea with to start the discussion. And um, it's about building that relationship on the long term. So it's not just a transaction. I come in do an engagement, collect some data and leave. It's no, we work with you on the long term. If you can bring in, if you're doing research and you can bring in participatory research where in some way you benefit the community at the same time. And it's um, a relationship that is between equals, it works a lot better. Right, uh, anybody else would like to respond? Yeah, Dr. Toshi, if we could just yeah, add to that, I guess uh, humility is very important because we do not have a silver bullet because every case, every locality would have different challenges and perhaps different set of solutions. So the ability to listen and to be really humble, you know, in the face of uncertainty is, is very important, I think, yeah. That relates to the, the, the theme of our conference as well, dignity and justice, yeah. Thank you, Hesri. Uh, we need to wrap up this panel discussion in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and uh, perhaps to be fair to all the panelists, I'll, I'll, I'll just like to do last you know, round of uh, uh, interventions and each of us, each of you can speak maybe in, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. And uh, to do that, I have a number of questions, but perhaps one of them I can, I can uh, share with you. Uh, I, I see various, uh, you know, voices about partnerships, you know, partnerships with different sectors and, and LOD um, has even said that perhaps uh, possibilities are even widening up in contrast with all these bad news uh, that are incoming to us, you know, impacts of uh, climate change. My question to you is specifically, what do you think the, the significance of the role of uh, higher educational institutions like, like you know, Chirangko University and I say that because we are doing the civic engagement, you know, very uh, community grounded, you know, um, an enterprise. Um, and yet on, on the turf of, uh, you know, uh, regional, uh, you know, uh, very high profile, uh, higher educational institutions like Chiranko University, and many of you are affiliated with uh, higher educational institutions. So what, what is the meaning uh, of us doing this on, on uh, the, the con in the context of education institutions, or what do you think uh, higher education institutions can do to promote civic engagement, uh, particularly with partnerships with, you know, different actors like the private sector and, and the government? Uh, if you can, you know, uh, make comment on that, uh, maybe that's something good to keep on record uh, so that uh, Chongko University people can, can listen to it later on. All right. So with the, and and you can say uh, anything else you'd like to add uh, as well. So let's go to the last round of interventions, and uh, um, anybody can start. Who'd like to speak first? Yep. Pencho, hey, Pencho, hey. are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> May I start for me. Yeah. I think it is quite an important question. Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to share the experience from my group. Like, for example, when we conduct a citizen science project, and we have to prove, we have to uh, like uh, try to do scientific scientific proof uh, in uh, the contamination area, uh, support and. Uh, collaboration from uh, institu academic institution is very important. For example, uh, in Thailand, there are an increasing number of lawsuits, uh, civil lawsuits uh, for, uh, by the communities uh, to against uh, the polluters. Uh, collecting data information and to, to prove uh, the pollution uh, we need a uh, lot, lot of types of support from the uh, scientists or from the academy. And as we're well asked to be uh, uh, for the, during the testimony in, in, in the court. But first of all, uh, I think uh, 
in Thailand, the com community environmental movement uh, at the community level now spread over the, the, the nation. Uh, but uh, the community movement uh, to protect natural resource environment, even the health, uh, will be uh, stronger if they have or they can access the information. Uh, and there are some uh, uh, support from uh, like uh, from civil society or from academics to simplify or to help them analyze the complicated data or compli complicated information and educate or uh, transfer these information to the community. So this is will, will, will be very helpful to, uh, to build up uh, the power of data and the power of movement of the community. So uh, the, the experience from uh, we have working uh, for more than 20 years, we found that uh, civil society have uh, limited resource and limited uh, capacity in in particular in scientific proof why the community also have a uh, limited resource as well the institutions have uh, some limitation on their part like uh, the law of the uh, the officers or the law of economic uh, inside the institution that are limited by those uh, structural limitation of each institution. So if we join together, build up the good collaboration between a community, civil society, and uh, academic institution, we can create the big power in negotiation or in, 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 in the environmental movement, not only the industrial pollution issue, but the climate change and other health issue as well. I, I, I would like to, to, to share a, a little bit more about the, the role of women uh, in Thailand, uh, as we, we observe that women, uh, women uh, are very important in environmental movement and in many, in many places in Thailand, uh, women initiate uh, lots of demonstration, negotiation and uh, build up uh, lots of uh, campaigns. Uh, at the community level. Maybe uh, some of them may move a little bit slower than men, but once they start off, they are uh, maybe more powerful than the movement of uh, uh, the campaign led by men and more sustained. Uh, in, in, this is in, in, in my observation from the experience that I work with uh, so lots of communities. Yeah, maybe I, I stop here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ben Chong. Okay, uh, it's gonna be the next. Hezri, are you are you on? Are, are you ready? Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Toshi. Maybe I just uh, relate back to uh, the chapter which I wrote in the uh, this civic engagement book, which on uh, policy entrepreneurship, uh, meaning that uh, you know there is a something called uh, intrastate or within state activism. We always feel that you know uh, to be a, an activist, you have to be outside of the government machinery. But there, you can be an activist within the government machinery. And this is where you use the language of uh, advocacy college, bring the people together and form a narrative in policy domain and try to connect the dots, you know? And uh, this, this is, uh, this is uh, an art, you know, there is a method in this madness if you like. So I am uh, working with, uh, about to start a, a module in University Malaya. Uh, they have a master's of uh, science and sustainability based in the science faculty in University Malaya. And they're they interested to see how we can sort of, uh, you know, uh, share this, uh, you know, policy entrepreneurship or policy brokering skill. And this is going to be, be uh, crafted in the, um, in the sort of a workshop uh, situation or, or module or, or method. And uh, we, we really look forward how, you know, we can bring in uh, former policymakers or, you know, current policymakers and those who have been active uh, in, in civil society but managed to bring social change and, and or issues in government, we'll have to like, bring them together to, to interact with students and, and hopefully this skill can be transferred to the future generation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Hezri. Yeah, I have also found that chapter quite uh, inspiring the concept of a, a policy broker, policy entrepreneur. So I can hi um, highly recommend that chapter or the entire book. Thank you. All right, uh, Refi or LOD? Okay, I LOD can, first. I then can go. Yeah. Please. Thank you, Toshi. Um, 
I think there are two things I would say. One, uh, universities are trusted, which is not the case often of governments or um, private sector enterprises. So universities hold a very special place in societies where we can be brokers of information and we can be the ones connecting the dots. Um, so if you think about disinformation, for example, around climate or other issues, universities can play an important role in providing information that the public and citizens will trust. So that's one thing. The other thing is we do play an important role in creating the next generation of leaders and making sure those leaders are uh, understanding of how they can bring in lenses of justice, lenses of community engagement into their work. Uh, that's something really, really interesting and something I'm quite passionate about as well. Um, we talked about interdisciplinary approaches. The more we can build those in with our students, the more it will be easier for them later on once they're, they are in positions to influence decisions, to look through those lenses of interdisciplinary approaches or collaborative approaches. So I think we, we have a big role to play in helping that next generation tackle these issues better maybe than we have. Thank you, Elodie. Uh, Rifai, are you ready? Yep. Uh, and, and I also agree with Elodie. Basically, the university probably the most significant institution right now we trust in. So, for example, they have a lot of students that can be the future kind of a generation for continuing the movement, especially in our contact and urban movement. We, we collaborate with university a lot. Because in the end, there, are, there, 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 there is a need to transfer this process to them, right? So in recent years, so for example, starting from 2015, we worked together with university, uh, Cornell University, to send a student to the field where we work, uh, just like a joint a collaboration field work. Uh, it's, it's in the package of uh, uh, re uh, action research format, so we collaborate with a university of uh, uh in in cornell and also in pan university and also in harvard we also connected recently for the last three years with ucl uh university college london where most of the student now connected to our urban citizenship academy student they collaborate in one kind of uh, villages where we work with the community so they they work like identify issues mapping kind of social problem and also identify what which stakeholder they can engage with something like that and then they they package it into like a certain kind of a result of like plan of intervention that we can promote to the government or other stakeholder to 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 be follow up so, so that that has been happening in Banjarmasin right now with uh, university college london where we focus working on inclusive public space intervention in in Benjamin, so for example yeah ab absolutely this is very disappointed for the last two years because we have to be in a pandemic situation so the student couldn't join with their college in Banjarmasin, so they work online and discuss what is the the collaboration that they can do uh together with the community this, this is really something that inspiring and i still believe that uh, collaboration civil society collaboration with university Will will be very very uh, important in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rifai. Okay, uh, we need to end this panel. Uh, it's not my intention to uh, summarize uh, all the interventions and and questions and comments. It's not just impossible, but uh, it's just not fair. Uh, and as long as uh, uh, all of us here. Uh, ground level experiences and and uh, uh, you know uh, get some insights and ideas to think about um, how we continue to promote civic engagement, uh, particularly you know well grounded, uh, and also making uh, meaningful changes. I, I think we can be just happy at that. Uh, except that uh, uh, at the end of this uh, conference, we'll have a short time for uh, synthesis, so uh, we can probably. Uh, leave the task of uh, 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 wrapping up uh, until I mean we, we can wait until until that moment. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there unless 
my co-moderator, uh, Seng Wan, do, do you have anything to say? No, 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 I think the last round of interventions is just perfect for the next uh, panel because it's about transformative learning and education uh, within the university and outside of the university. So I just uh, ask everybody to remember those last <laughs> uh, nuggets of wisdom and we can develop further on that. Okay, yeah. so with that, I think we should pass back to Bichiko. Yeah. Great, so I'd like uh, uh, everyone to stay tuned and uh, after lunch break, uh, we're gonna have another panel. Uh, yeah, so please come back and I will uh, return the microphone to Michiko. Yes, okay, thank you very much, Toshisan, Sengguan, and all the speakers and audience and the, the questions, engaging questions with the panel with your comments. And uh, I think we'll continue after the lunch break. Um, we'll begin the second panel session at 13.30 uh, Bangkok time. Thank you very much and see you again very soon. Bye. Bye. again and over to you Michiko. Thank you Helmis. Welcome back to the virtual conference civic engagement building resilient global communities. <clears throat> Once again it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Toshiyuki Doi, academic advisor of the Institute of Asian Studies Chulalongko University and Dr. Yo Sengwan from Monash University to lead and facilitate the panel discussions. Over to you, Sengwan and Toshi-san. Yes, thank you very much, Michiko. Uh, welcome back. Uh, so now the, the, the role is sort of reversed. I will be in the foreground and uh, Toshi-san will be in the background monitoring for trollers, no, <laughs> um, bad guys. Okay, so uh, I think after lunch, normally we're drowsy. So I thought we'd do a little exercise. I mean, Ted would normally do this kind of stuff if we were offline, but uh, since we are virtual, so I've asked Hermes to prepare a survey to do a word cloud. So maybe we just, Hermes, can we just put up the link for people to, yeah. So can you just, uh, all of us just spend about maybe two or three minutes thinking about this and typing in your phrases, and then we will generate a word cloud out of this to see what uh, people are thinking. All right, so we have about three minutes starting now. technical note as well. Um, if you can open a browser or use your phone and go to menti.com, as you see, it will ask you to enter that eight digit code at the top of the screen. All right, good. Some words are coming up. Okay, one more minute to put in your words or phrases. All right, and see people is like the recurrent word. People, sustainable. Survival of the planet, working together building skills, justice, citizen empowerment. Okay, maybe the last 30 seconds. I can see people are in the waiting room. Maybe you want to admit it. Yeah, uh, there's a Chloe gun. Dr. Sengwan, I can actually keep this link open and we can send it out periodically. So if you yeah, would like to right. revisit it later, we yeah. can do so as well. All right, so don't, just leave it there for a second. 
All right, so this is my way to seek to segue into our second session, which is basically entitled Building Resilient Global Communities Through Civic Engagement in Times of Uncertainty to Focus on Transformative Learning slash Education. So I'm looking for the word education and learning in this word cloud. And I don't see it. <laughs> so it comes, maybe it, it is expressed in other ways. So not to worry, we will come back to this later. Yeah. So uh, maybe you can sort of minimize this. Uh, Hermes. So in the morning, uh, I won't try to summarize, but um, in the morning, we have four uh, distinguished panelists uh, who are basically activists. Yeah, uh, I would say sort of scholar activists uh, who and activists and who, who shared their own case studies or own experiences of uh, addressing the topic. So in this afternoon, we continue this trajectory again, but this time uh, I notice in the four panelists, two are from public universities are based in public university, uh, universities. One is from a civil society group uh, involved with education uh, in a non-formal setting. Uh, one is from a global entity. Okay, uh, And all these different uh, panelist members are in a sense based or embedded in different educational contexts. Uh, they have, they address um, well, the issues of civic engagement at a different scale, right? Or uh, at a different scales and different constituencies even. So they are in, in as provided in your um, what do you call that uh, agenda, Dr. Sit, six, uh, Dr. Diki Sofjan, who is from the Indonesian Consortium of Religious Studies based in UKM, Universitas, Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta. Hands up, please. Yeah, it's to the uh, Dr. Susan. Vice, right? I hope I pronounced your surname right. Or Sue, I think uh, earlier on we were talking. Your name is Sue. She's regional advisor for social and human sciences in Asia and the Pacific, the UNESCO uh, Bangkok branch. Sue, your hands up, please. Yeah, with a nice Hello, background. Everybody. Is that a virtual background or you're really in the forest? <laughs> um, it's actually a photo I took in Samoa. Oh, okay, all right. Then we have Ted Mayer. Academic Director of the Institute of Transformative Learning International Network for Engaged Buddhists. Yes, where's Ted? Yeah, okay. And last but not least, we have Dr. Chawan Chai Sukal from the Department of Biology, Deputy and also Deputy Director for the Center of Learning Network for the region in Pangsinga, Nan Province, Chulalongkong University. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so the, the, the topic of our meditation will be on, and the meditation will be on transformative learning in, and the, the various experiments you have done at your different contexts, right? And skills, so the, the things I mentioned earlier. All right, so before we start the two questions again, I would like to ask my fellow panelists, maybe you would, uh, whether you would welcome a change in the way I would moderate this. In the morning, we did two rounds, okay? We addressed the first question, the first round, then the second question. I would like to propose that we do the two questions all in one round so that uh, your answers become more coherent and it'll be easier for the participants to get the full breadth of your engagement as well as the challenges face, right? Instead of two rounds, one single round, which means you have longer time to speak, right? Uh, so maybe 10 minutes per person, all right? Would that be, you think would be more workable for you? rather than uh, break the chain and come back a second round, because that will require us to remember what you said in the first round, in the first place. All right, so I see smiles. Okay. All right, okay, so we'll okay. do that. Yes, so we'll do, you answer both questions in 10 minutes. All right, so maybe five, five, or up to you. The, the proportion is up to you. Uh, and then we come to, um, well, quote unquote, interventions from either me or from a fellow panelists, right? You can ask one another, uh, no certain in, uh, questions or insights you have. If I have certain insights, I would ask you, yeah? And, and then the second round will be basically, if you like, more for q and I would like to allo allocate more time for discussion with the participants, okay? Uh, a more, you know, a lengthy, in-depth in discussion if possible. Okay, so the order, I will follow what is provided here. All right, Diki, Su, Ted, and then Chachawa. Okay, so uh, do you have the questions in front of you? You will send you will send these guidelines. If not, if, uh, you have time to pull it out now, and maybe I will read it again, and I can pull it out. Uh, yeah. So the first, there are two questions, right? What civic engagement activities are you currently practicing in co-designing resilient global 
communities. So I suppose this will be more about the, from the transformative education point of view. Yeah. Second, what challenges are you facing and how are you trying to overcome them? Okay. What challenges are you facing and how are you trying to overcome them? So maybe before uh, we ask you to start, I'll just preface a little bit. I mean, my own little spiel about university education, right? So we know that uh, university education is becoming quite universal and highly aspired for by the younger generation uh, because it is uh, a pathway for jobs, right? Uh, a pathway from, uh, 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 to social mobility, right? Getting a better place in life for themselves and for their families. But I also remember a very old book, that maybe the people of my generation and before will remember, a book by Ivan Illich about the skilling <laughs> that universities have, maybe that may not fulfill this function, all right? Uh, when, because they, 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 they create silos or you know, they, create, they create little uh, very micro kind of uh, education, micro specialization that does not equip them with seeing the whole picture or big picture. Right, uh, and people burrow in these tiny little uh, silos. So I'm, I'm interested in that, in that kind of understanding, all right? What does transformative education look like in the very context that you are embedded in, in universities, right? Uh, the two public universities. I teach in a private university in Malaysia, right? Uh, Monash University, Malaysia. And uh, to put it very simply, it has certain priorities are higher than others, which might not be the same for public universities. Yeah. So what would transformative education look like in high schools if you want to catch them young, all right? Or even in kindergarten level, right? For the younger generation. Uh, but of course, you don't have to answer that because you're not in that context, but you could if you have, right? And what are we transforming them into? What is it that we want our, uh, well, for our students and people who are in formal and non-formal settings to be equipped with, yeah? Is it to address those, quest those questions or answers provided in the word cloud just now that we saw briefly? Or is it more? Yeah. All right. So with that, uh, you ask Dicky to start the ball rolling with his thoughts. Yeah. Off you go. 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Sanguan. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, marvelous uh, platform. I feel like we are, you know, reuniting. Uh, together, you know, from the Bangkok Forum, from the civic engagement, uh, you know, platforms and meetings in Solo, in Bali, and, and elsewhere. Um, so I am Dikis Sofjan from the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies, and based in the Graduate School of the Universitas Gajah Mada in Yogyakarta. And uh, Sengguan had correctly pointed out that uh, Gajah Mada University is the largest uh, public university in Indonesia with around 68,000 students and 2,500 professors and uh, educators. Um, but I'm wearing two hats here, one as an academic and the other as as you call it, a scholar activist, I guess, yeah, because the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies is really an association of scholars and researchers and activists uh, from the three universities, the public university, the Islamic State University, and also the private Christian university. So we have been engaging in interreligious education, research and community service for the past 15 years. And we have been working along uh, the lines of uh, many different uh, areas of concern, which relates to religion, faith, and spirituality. So obviously, we delve into uh, issues of education, research, and community services uh, along the lines of uh, freedom of religion, belief, uh, religious harmony, religion and politics and human rights, uh, climate change, sustainability, uh, gender, and many other different social uh, aspects. Yeah? Um, we have been working quite a bit on uh, the freedom of religion and belief and the issue of religious harmony, which is also taken up by the government for a number of years now. As we know that our society right now is facing um, a problem and uh, we are facing what's called the conservative turn uh, which is really uh, digressing from uh, the more sort of progressive um, scenarios that we intellectuals usually envision 
our society to be, you know, when you have globalization, when you have the free market and so on, that people will ultimately become more liberal and more progressive. But as we are seeing uh, right now, that the trend is actually, uh, you know, turning, that the tide is turning, that, that people and communities and, society, uh, and groups in society are becoming much more conservative. And for the uh, religious groups, we are seeing that many of them are indeed turning to conservatives. And what this actually translates into is that the society will become uh, uh, much more polarized uh, in many different ways, uh, both socially, politically, culturally, uh, and obviously ideologically. And we have seen this in many uh, different contexts. I think the US is a, is, is a prime example of this during the rise of the Trump era, right? With the uh, conservatism and the sort of um, Christian conservative groups, uh, uh, you know, coming to the fore and um, really splitting society um, as we never have seen before in the US. Uh, and obviously here in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in obviously the extreme case is in Myanmar, where we are seeing an extreme form of uh, religious uh, identity, which is uh, combined with, um, you know, political or the politicization of uh, religion. And so um, what we have in terms of challenge is that we are facing a society that is increasingly conservative and polarized, but yet we know uh, just based on our uh, data and also um, underlying assumption that many people in this region in Southeast Asia are uh, indeed uh, religious, yeah? uh, if not spiritual meaning to say that they hold religion, faith and spirituality as something that is very important in their lives. Yeah? They take cues from their religious tradition, their texts, the sacred texts, their doctrines, and what their religious authorities say about many different things, right? So members of society decide on, uh, you know, what they uh, eat, you know, um, their food, for instance, the diet is based on their religious convictions, where they put their children in schools, yeah, and the activities that, that you know, they should be engaging in, and the kinds of, uh, you know, political socialization uh, that our students, our youths are uh, undergoing, for instance, yeah, and obviously the peer pressure of, of uh, you know, religious groups can be quite daunting uh, in, in many contexts, as, as we probably know, and hence you have a lot of uh, recruitment uh, on many of the more militant and extreme uh, religious organizations targeting uh, the youths, yeah? including people and, and students from, you know, junior high school, high school to university students. So what we have done as, as one of our strategies was to, de to develop a nationwide uh, uh, project called, called the Religious Literacy Project. And essentially this is to sort of um, undermine the trend and, and also to emphasize that in our current educational system that we teach a lot on religion, yeah? And, but yet barely know much or barely teach our children about religion. Meaning to say that uh, there's a lot of religion being taught in school, but not about religious uh, you know, uh, challenges and the uh, problems and the dynamics um, that surround uh, the phenomenon of religion and religious communities and, and whatnot. And so we have trained uh, for the past three years, we have trained almost 1,000 religious extension officers and the local religious leaders, the imams, the ustads, uh, the priests, the uh, ministers and the bhikkhus and so on uh, throughout, um, I think, uh, from 12 to 14 different districts and majorities in Indonesia. And, um, you know, we are 
uh, developing this idea that, you know, uh, to confront the problem of a religious conservatism is, is that it really begins uh, from how we educate uh, our students, our youths, and, and the masses and, and the people. Yeah, and obviously the social media has um, a role to play because we are seeing that a lot of these religious conservatives conservatives are also uh, very active in in the in the social media and so what what we've done um, is is to sort of bring in this idea that uh, you know learning religion is good but learning about religion is probably much more um, helpful for a multicultural multi-religious society meaning to say uh, that we need to get members of society to be more uh, appreciative uh, on differences, on uh, identities and the different challenges that religious communities, especially the minorities face. And as we can all probably um, witness that even during this pandemic, we are increasingly seeing that religious communities are being uh, minoritized. Yeah? So um, prior to the pandemic, we've seen that some religious minorities have been uh, minoritized yeah? uh, offline. But now during the pandemic, we have uh, seen an exponential uh, increase as well in the minoritization of some of the uh, religious communities that, that we work with. And so our job, I think, is to be able to sort of transform the way people look at society, uh, the way people look at religious diversity and the different um, uh, you know, strains in the religious convictions of people, of communities. And I think this is um, one great challenge if we were to think really about um, you know, co-designing resilient global communities. So I think I'll just stop there, uh, Sengguan, and I'll be happy to um, explain more later on. Thank you very much. Yeah, excellent. Uh, on time, below time effect. You use not your nine minutes very well. So next in line, it's who, who did I say it was? <laughs> I forget. Susan. Sue. Yeah. Sue. All right. Yes. Over to you, Sue. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as um, you heard, my name is Sue Vives and I work with the UNESCO Regional Office here in Bangkok. Um, and I have been working, I guess, several years now with UNESCO, particularly in the area of youth engagement. And uh, we run a number of uh, youth engagement issues and we've increasingly been using co-design as part of these. Today, I will tell you uh, about our largest and most uh, current initiative, which is called Youth as Researchers. So this actually started out of a, a research project on empathy education. And the reason that this came up was that uh, it look, looking for ways to develop skills of empathy in young people to connect them better with the society. So research is actually showing that when we empathize with other people, we connect more with community. And that means that we are going to actually be more aware of societal issues, be more wanting to contribute to responding to societal issues, whether they're environmental or social or cultural or religious. And so this pro program was born out of that. And it was actually originally done with high school students. So there is some connection back to high school students there. Um, so this is a program that we had been working with for a couple of years with some universities, and it consists of training and then working with young people to conduct and use research. So the reason why it's been um, quite an interesting exercise is because not only is it has it got that skills building side for the young people, but also interestingly it has quite a, a good record in terms of providing good policy information particularly when you want to research issues that can be sensitive 
involving young people. And I can give you an example. Um, one of the pieces of research that was done early on was looking at youth carers. So these are people who had parents who had physical disabilities, dementia, or other things, and they found themselves in a role as carers rather than the children being looked after. So when young people are going out and doing the research, they can get quite different information from other young people than older researchers can do simply by this rapport that they can establish, the empathy that they, they can share with the other young people. So the type of information that was coming out of the research was really good. So obviously, everybody knows we had the COVID pandemic last year, and we were planning to upscale our work we were doing on this. So we decided to launch an initiative specifically relating to COVID, how young people are being impacted, and also how, how young people are responding to COVID. So um, we set up a, uh, a program virtually so that young people weren't putting themselves at risk and they could still conduct research. And essentially, this is a large training and mentoring program to enable young people to build research skills, but to also think about how they use research in terms of advocacy, trying to make policy change, etc. So we have uh, 34 research teams globally. Uh, 10 of them are in Asia Pacific. We had 6,000 applicants. So this is a really interesting part for me is the motivation of young people to be involved in this. Clearly, this is the kind of thing that young people want. In terms of being engaged, they can see that there are advantages in the skills, but they also are attracted to this because they want to be able to use it to make change. So I think when we're designing our civic engagement, it's really important not to just think about the information that we can get out of it, but how people can use the skills and the other component of what we're giving to them. And, and I think the probably about 50% um, of our young people participating are university students. And um, the, the feedback that we have with this is that it really complements a lot of what they do in university because in the university they get to write the paper they don't really get to use it for anything and i know there are more and more innovative uh, activities in universities where they're actually trying to apply their social entrepreneurship models or uh, more participatory action learning type things but uh, a lot of universities still don't have the capacity to do that and uh, it's really interesting taking them through the process from the beginning. When they start off, they're in a team. Another skill that they're learning is how to work on an international project with people from other countries. Uh, they don't necessarily get to do that at university. Some universities, obviously, they do. But they're actually working with people who are all around the world, not just people at their university. So this is also another skill that they're, they're learning. They're learning to write papers, they're learning a, a whole lot of other different things. So the other thing about this is it's actually a large scale co-design exercise because we started this off with a training package that we normally go into countries to do uh, with a trainer. We go in for a week, we do the training, we work with them on their design and then we mentor them through this. But since we've had to adapt and change the whole thing, uh, every week, we've had a meeting every week since March last year of our design team, which is a university people, UNESCO people and young people, um, responding and trying to deal with the issues that come up on a very timely basis. And uh, things like, oh, when we publish this, we don't necessarily always realize how much information the young people don't know. So the whole thing has grown through this big co-design exercise from the consortium. And I have to say, um, having a, a range of different people from different continents, from different um, technical backgrounds has been a really good in terms of being able to uh, develop something that that hopefully is working and we hope that it's actually responsive to what young people want 
and need from this. So moving on to some of the challenges, I think um, the first one for us has been motivation. And I think whenever you work with community, uh, yes, they're very excited and they want to do things, but as things move on, uh, it's quite difficult to maintain the motivation. And um, well, we've been going for a year and a half now, and uh, I guess we started off with 6,000 applicants. We initially, I think, engaged about 350 people in the research teams. We still have about 270 of them left. Um, the, the key things to me with the motivation would be that there has to be some kind of reward or benefit for them from that. And that's not necessarily personal, because what I will say is the motivation of a lot of these young people is, um, has two elements. One is the personal development they can get in terms of building their skills and careers, but the other is a genuine desire to actually contribute to their communities. So when we're thinking about maintaining the motivation, I think we need to think about both of those elements. Um, the reward that we can provide them personally is possibly a little bit easier because we can give them a certificate for the training. We can, um, we're giving them the skills. Um, we're going to publish the work that they're doing. So their name will be on like a United Nations publication. This is a personal benefit for them. The motivation to give back to the community is more difficult because we get questions like, will the government listen to our recommendations? And obviously you all know that when it comes to government listening to community recommendations, there's different levels of responsiveness about that. So, um, and I think it's the same if that, that's a recommendation from the UN, by the way, it's not necessarily because they're youth, but um, this, this one uh, we're actually planning on a, a kind of a conference with decision makers, so they're gonna have a dialogue with them. So even if government doesn't act on it, they do get a good opportunity to put forward their ideas and to at least see government's response and reaction. And we hope that that uh, helps to maintain the motivation there. I think um, the second, the second um, challenge for us is that we're generating an awful lot of information. And um, I really appreciate our speaker this morning, Kun Penchon, because she talked a lot about having to have the evidence and then utilizing the evidence in the way that they retrain themselves to do this. And so we're, we're collecting all this evidence now and we're hopefully we're making the connection in young people that if they really want decision makers to listen to the advocacy of the messages that they wanna get through, having a strong evidence base is a really good strategy for doing that. But all of this information and, and how we can actually get that to the right place to be used and even understand if it is going to be used is going to be quite difficult. And um, so we will be doing publications. That's the easy part because this is a, a kind of a one way of getting the information out. The two way part is a lot more difficult, um, but we're not only collecting information on through the research that the young people are doing, monitoring this process itself and understanding the co-design exercise and uh, how we can harness this um, desire of young people to contribute to COVID, I think in itself is a big learning and research exercise and how we learn to understand and utilize that information is also a challenge for us. Um, Another challenge for us, I think, is that we have brought together young people from very different social, economic and cultural backgrounds in different time zones all over the world with different levels of education and with different expectations about the program. And so when we're thinking about a community, I think this just reinforces that communities aren't homogenous. And when we're talking about civic engagement, we actually have to be aware of the kind of differences within the community. When if we want to actually get the best effect out of this, how can we um, cater to those differences of uh, the participants in terms of their needs? 
how can we actually get them more involved? And I'll give you an example here. Um, if we have an 18 year old who's maybe in just started at university um, compared to a 27 year old who's just handed in their PhD thesis, their ability to engage with the exercise differs. And so we have to be able to respond differently to their needs to be able to create a program in which that 18 year old can still contribute to the co-design and not be pushed into the background by the more articulate, more experienced 27 year old. So when we're thinking about co-design, we also need to think about the fact that we have to actually provide mentoring and skills and support for them to be part of the co-design exercise. So this is in addition to the research that they're doing to be able to participate in the bigger design and longer term nature of this exercise. How can they be in, how can they get access to all of the information that's going on? This is involving hundreds of people and they need to understand that. And then how can they bring their own ideas to the next iteration of this when we, when we relaunch this in, an, in another topic in the future? So I think those are, are definitely three of the challenges we're facing. And uh, the other one, of course, is internet, connectivity, time zones, and this whole thing of connecting in a virtual world. I don't think that's specific to, to this particular exercise, but um, yeah, so, so this is what we're working on. We don't know entirely how the whole thing will turn out yet, but um, we've just actually got 32 of the first papers in, the, the first like summaries of what they're doing um, to prepare everything. And uh, it's, I think that they've done an amazing job. So I, I really applaud all the young people that have been involved and um, can't wait to see their longer papers that they've produced later. Yeah, thanks Sue. Sounds like an excellent project, right? It's <laughs> fun project. too. Yeah, but but I think like all of us know, online learning sucks, right? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, Ted, I'm sure you have talks, lots of things to share about and also to interact later. Yeah, it's over to you now, Ted. You're muted. Thank you, Singwan. Uh, it's an honor to be with all of you in attendance and also uh, to be part of this panel. I'm Ted Mayer. Uh, I'm an anthropologist from the US, but I was born in India, have lived in Thailand a long time. I, um, I work for the International Network of Engaged Buddhists. And uh, some six years ago, they asked me to design uh, basically an English and leadership course. And um, they had their own reasons for that, but part, the, the one worth mentioning perhaps is that um, the, the lingua franca of the network is English, even though the large, major, the, so the large majority of the participants are in Asia, but, but important, significant membership are in uh, Europe and, and uh, North America also. So um, I wanna begin by saying that um, uh, my concept, our concept of transformative learning uh, builds on quite a long experience of, of, of Thai Buddhist activists and educators who have been developing alternative forms of alternative education for some time. In fact, uh, it builds on our concept of transformative learning builds on an entire movement within Buddhism, which is known as socially engaged Buddhism. And that movement has some very illustrious um, leaders around the world, both monk and both monastic and lay. And the key, the, one of the key elements is that uh, transform, transformation is seen as going in two directions. Uh, and, and many people beyond this group uh, see this, but so transform, transformation, transformative learning has to go inward, that, that we must allow ourselves to become transformed. We must grow beyond our uh, our limitations, our greed, our um, our fear, and so on. And that this is a very critical, deep part of Buddhism. But but this group is also a group that sees uh, Buddhism as inspiring one to work for change in society because 
you know, one of the key things in Buddhism is to end suffering, is to alleviate suffering. And we know from anthropology, sociology, and from reading the evidence that that the, stru the structures of society that we now live under create and replicate suffering on a tremendous scale. So that Buddhists of this variety see that we have to address the structural nature, the sources of suffering. So, so um, transformative learning means transforming a relationship to yourself, but also transforming a relationship to what's going on around us. Um, uh, I, so I said about designing, I, I, I'm not only an anthropologist, but also a language teacher. And uh, I, I, I said about designing a course that, um, let, 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 let me put it a little differently. Let me, let me share one of my inspirations, who is um, Alastair McIntyre, a very uh, wonderful Scottish philosopher, in a, in a wonderful talk critiquing modern universities, asked, how is it possible that the most brilliant graduates of the most prestigious universities in North America were responsible for the biggest catastrophes of the 20th century and the early 21st century. And he named specifically 50 years of, fail, of abject failure in US policy towards Iran, uh, the, the devastating Vietnam War with some 1 million casualties in Vietnam, and the devastating uh, economic crisis of 2007, 2008. So that question really inspired me because it, it relates to what I feel about the present, which is, I'll transform the question a little bit. How is it possible that we have such wonderful universities and I love higher learning, I love the university environment, yet we have crisis after crisis. We have the climate crisis, we have a huge crisis of increasing inequality. Um, and how is it that we have young adults who feel so lost and so powerless, not to mention their professors who may similarly feel lost and powerless when it comes to the wider world. So, so um, I said about, we said about designing a course that would uh, try to address those questions. So it's not just an English course. Um, it's an English course that uses the latest concepts and skill and practices of, of language teaching. And by the way, that is one thing that needs huge transformation in much of Asia, in Thailand for sure, in China, in much of Asia, the, the simple approach to something uh, like language teaching is very, very old and often very ineffective. So that's one thing we're trying to do in a new way. But, but we're also doing something else, which is kind of, I think, innovative at a global scale. And that is that we're, we're teaching an English course that also aims to uh, support the growth, the very, the, the genuine growth of the, of the students themselves. Um, and their knowledge of the wider world. So what are we trying to do? We, so, so I feel in my 20 years of working within the university I've, that I've met, I've always wanted to teach uh, a sort of pre-university preparation because what I see is that um, not only can you walk through Bangkok or through airports and never have the slightest whiff that we're in a crisis, in the sense that you will see all kinds of advertisements with men wearing expensive watches and women putting on face cream and all the social media, but you would never, you would never, you know, be, be given information about oh the huge inequality crisis, the huge crisis of violence. So I have felt that for some time I wanted to run a course that was like a almost like a university kindergarten. Where are we in the world and who are you and what you what can you do? And and what we find is that what I find consistently is that young adults don't know what they can do. They, they, may, they, they may be caught in this sort of uh, a channel of, okay, I have to get skills, I have to get a job, I have to take care of my family. Well, that's not gonna change the world. It's not even gonna take care of their family because right now things like the pandemic and um, the, you know, all these other crises, especially the climate crisis are going to undermine all the basis for stability of the family. So, so basically what we do to put it in a few words is that we invite small groups of, of budding leaders from around mostly Southeast Asia, but also beyond including Japan and, and India. 
we, we invite groups of up to 18 students at a time, and we work with that very small group. And we begin by affirming their existence, okay, which I, I think is a really radical thing to do. It's not about what you can do, your skills, your, your scores, your achievements. It's about the fact that you are a living human being with brilliant intelligence, regardless of your grades, and you can do much in the world. And, and, and that's where we start. And we, we uh, reinforce that by um, providing numerous occasions for students to listen to each other. And, and my background, uh, aside from my anthropology, is that I'm a, a, a certified teacher of a, a peer listening process called co-counseling, and, and we use that. And it helps people deal with their fears. And, it, and so what we see in our program um, is that over, over six years, we just, just yesterday finished our sixth program. Um, it was a 12 hour workday for me. So uh, yeah, I'm glad I could be here with you. But what we see is that students love being together. They love learning how dire the what a, what a dire straits the world is in. How could they love that? Because it's real. Because they feel honored and respected to be shared honest information that things are not fine. Things are not good. <laughs> yes, they're beautiful in some ways, but but overall we're in a deep crisis that even leaders cannot solve very well. Um, I could say more, but let me jump to the challenges because I see that my time is coming to a close. The challenges are immense. And um, the one challenge is, of course, the pandemic. Uh, we will likely not have, we, 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 we created a three month in person course, which has been very effective. And we take students to meet leaders in Thailand. It's another whole dimension of what we do, but we couldn't do that this year because of the pandemic. Probably we will work only online and do, maybe do short courses next year. Um, after the pandemic, I wanna be honest that the biggest uh, challenge for us is the trend in Asia towards nationalistic, conservative, controlling and repressive governments. And um, you know, the first of course is Myanmar. Um, it's, it's a catastrophe what's happening in Myanmar. Uh, the Buddhist activists in Thailand have worked very closely for decades with the activists in Myanmar. And what's happening in Myanmar is the absolute decimation of a culture and a society by the military coup, and uh, has, which is proving itself completely incapable of running the society, of handling the pandemic, um, it has zero legitimacy, and the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar is um, is a, a very broad, if not 100 percent, is very broad unity. So what does it mean for us? It means that we have to work in the shadow of our own students being under threat and facing danger just for coming to study with us. And literally, we took on a student from Myanmar who's who in the second week of our class saw her brother on TV, br brutally beaten and tortured, which the military does to scare people. Don't you dare uh, join any kind of activism. So I want to express <laughs> my deep sorrow about this kind of thing. And the fact that ASEAN was completely a failure in responding to it, and that is disappointing. Um, not only ASEAN, but, but other countries around the world. So it's not just Myanmar, however. There is a strong tendency um, in other large countries in Asia, such as India, such as China, to be nationalistic, to be, to be self-protective, to repress voices of dissent. This is very, very clear. And I want to make clear that I'm not speaking as a U.S. Uh, a, a superior critic. I am just as critical of the U.S. government. And in fact, I would advocate that everybody uh, because the US and China are both superpowers, I, I really encourage my students and everyone to study what's happening in the US and what's happening in China. And I believe that from now on, my attitude will be that not, not only has the, have US leaders uh, forsaken their powerful ancestry of US thinkers, US philosophers, US political thinkers and educators, but China has done the same. That we can see, you know, China just just uh, celebrated the hundredth anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, and it's very clear that the current leadership in China has forsaken the very universalistic, very um, cosmopolitan earlier leadership in some areas of the Chinese Communist Party. And I feel 
I would never have said this before, but I feel now it's important to be critical towards these overwhelmingly powerful powers. They have a huge influence on what we can do. The third challenge is funding, but uh, that's always a challenge for NGOs. And I think I'll leave it there and I'm sure there'll be a chance to respond further. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Last but not, uh, not least, of course, Achan Chachawan, you have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, muted, please unmute. Okay, thank you. Uh, my work is as a biologist, um, have me to work with the communities and for the Center for Learning Network in the region of Chilong Kong University, this is like the arms of university to touch in the regional and communities level. And for our work that's involved in like reforestation and conservation in the area, something like Nan Province, which is the main watershed of uh, Chao Phraya River. And for that, we uh, have seen several problems that the uh, changing of the landscape of the people, of the value of the people. And we try to get some of that back to the communities and we try to involve with the youth and children so that they can be the leader in the future. So we have one project that has been run for like six years and uh, we try to uh, teach the children to like bird watching so that they can engage in their own environment in their communities. So what, what we provide them is that the skill and how, how to uh, identify the birds, something like that. And after that, they uh, go with the school project. So, and they try to decide something, some school they want to have like a project that more like a scientific project to conduct like in the community forest. And the other, they try to transfer that, that knowledge about bird watching to the younger generation, something like that. So we have differentiated uh, communities like the urban area and the, uh, the school that located in like a rural area when the students uh, walk out of their uh, classroom, they can see all the forest, okay? So in that, in that case, we try to have them to think about what surrounding themselves and what they can do with that. And we try to have them uh, to have awareness of some other problem with Nan Province, which is the deforestation. And at CLNR, we have several projects going on about the reforestation, such as like the incentive to reforest by uh, inoculate the fungus that will produce mushroom when you plant the seedling for like three or four years after that. And the people tend to uh, perceive well on that, but uh, the thing is that they just see in, uh, that in terms of economic value, but actually there's something like aesthetic value in like a reforestation as well. So in that case, we try to uh, enhance these uh, techniques through the children so that they can uh, maybe like tell their community that what should we do with the forest it's not just give us the food or like the timbers and so on, but it's also give us something else, something like the, how to be human, how to appreciate the life, how to appreciate the nature. So in that case, uh, several schools, they incorporate this one into their curriculum. Uh, we have some case, one case, we have students with uh, attention deficit disorder and uh, they cannot like do anything more than like five minutes and after that, we, when we teach the uh, bird washing, they can like uh, watch for birds like for hours. And then the teachers at the school, uh, they incorporate this into the curriculum. So like the mathematics, they, instead of summing or subtracting something else, they use birds, okay? Try to find the density of the birds in the area, something like that. So they incorporate in that or in the art and in music, they add bird into that curriculum as well. So that's one of uh, our work. And right now in the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, what we have uh, seen is that we have re 
or people from industrial area or from service sector back to their hometown. And that is not just the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, accelerated that. It has been going on for a while. People want to go back to their hometown to do something about that. And we did something like uh, retraining and reskilling of the people, uh, like farming or raising animals or processing some of the natural products or the agricultural products into something that they can sell for their living, something like that. So they don't need to uh, look for job in the urban area or in the industrial area. So we, we have been doing that for a while, but last year is more like an acceleration that we have because the government, uh, they see that the, the new, newly graduate, they have problem to find a job and as well as the people in the service sector. So we at the universities uh, and several universities in Thailand participate in this program we call University to Tambon. So Tambon is a local administration. So in Thailand, we have about like 5,000 Tambon and each university are asked to like uh, provide support for each Tambon to uh, help to mitigate this problem from uh, COVID-19. So at Jolongkorn University, we, what we did is that we try to decide a program that like the skilling and retraining of the people who lost their job or, or they want to go back to their hometown. So what we did is that the first phase, we uh, retrained them to with the uh, local government in order to uh, in, do some inventory of what they have in that tambon, something like uh, plant animals and art and cultures in that tambon. That is the information that the local government need to do anyway. But by that, by doing that, we also um, add some skills to them, something like uh, using the GPS to locate something, do the mapping and try to uh, come up with uh, what should be the business or what should be the work that you would want to do with your local resources. Because for some people, they start doing something like handicraft made from vegetable grass. So which is the local grass that uh, going around for the soil conservation. And we try to group them together and make them join together. So we try to have the farmers who grow vegetable grass and we have the manufacturers who have the hand weaving into bags and to products of that. And then we have the uh, newly graduate and the people maybe with no knowledge of their local products at all, but they have skill in uh, internet skill in social media and skill in marketing. So we ask them to join together to form a group. Right now we have about 20 people at each Tambon, uh, Jolongkorn University take care about uh, four Tambon right now. And we have them about 20 people in a group, working group to try to create a network that they can develop some product or some, uh, some skill that they can uh, translate into improve in economic of the local area. So right now it's ongoing right now, but we do have some uh, problem a little, little bit that uh, we have been limited by the number of people that we uh, can do in a workshop. And we have to use a lot of like, only 20 people can be hand on in the workshop and maybe the less you can look at like a, a from Zoom or from uh, Facebook Live, something like that. So it's kind of like uh, changing how we learn something or how we participate in something. But many people say that uh, it's really important that you need to, to meet face in face, okay? Because you can have dialogue and you can have some information exchange that is really better than what we do in the Zoom or in the web, something like this. That why something like why we have lunch or why we have coffee break, we can have this course in what, the, what is the problem, what we try to do in, in that. So, um, and one another aspect, aspect is that when, with this project, we try to involve our students, the university student in, into this project as well. But right now with the uh, restriction on traveling and on the vaccination, 
something like that, that we could not have uh, more students to participate in some of these projects to learn from the people and to have some input in what they're trying to do because uh, several students who try uh, to do several projects, they, they have some good idea, but they have no people to uh, guide them, especially the local people to, to do that. So I guess what we have as uh, the challenge right now is like a co-working in the environment that we need to have some sort of hybrid uh, training or some sort of hybrid education that we have going on. And we had to find uh, some um, optimization of how we can have the certain people that can have hand-on experience and some experience have to be transferred into the, uh, into the web or into the internet meeting, something like this that we have right now. So I guess uh, this is a challenge that we gonna have in the next few years until this pandemic go away. But right now we still have some project that are still going on and it's really doing well because we have local staff in the area that can be the people who coordinate that in the area. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think I've forgotten to, to announce that uh, if you have questions, you can start populating chat box now. It would be good if you could uh, say to whom you would, would like to address this question to. It could be one or more than one panelist. So we're waiting for you to populate and uh, Toshi-san to gather them. Maybe I will start the ball rolling by asking one question to Diki. Let me think. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so I suppose if I want to dramatize what you just said, uh, there is a disease of the mind going on uh, in terms or disease of this ease of not able to uh, not able to appreciate and even tolerate religious differences. Yeah, or even within the same religion, different emphasis in uh, spiritual practices within a particular religion going on in Indonesia and elsewhere. You didn't say you just. You, I mean, you you kept, you encapsulate that as conservatism, right? And therefore, by 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 implication, conservatism is bad. Yeah, and I suppose we say the opposite. Religious pro, uh, progressives are good. Yeah, but am I? I mean, isn't hasn't this been, always been a facet of religious affiliation? There have always been two wings of the same thing, and they are part of the yin and yang business. But but what is it about the present world condition that? accelerates, let's say, the imbalance between the yin and yang of two religious expressions. If you understand my question? Mm. I sort of understand your question. <laughs> mm. um, and, and that's a difficult question, right? Because um, I think, I, you know, um, after studying religion uh, for quite some time and doing research on religion for quite some time, I'm beginning to think that, you know, religious people are essentially conservative. Uh, you know, the recent, the most recent uh, studies uh, in Indonesia conducted by the Islamic University in Jakarta, uh, when they did this uh, survey of um, how Muslims are engaging in social media and the internet, uh, you know, they found out that around 67% of Muslims who are engaging in the internet and social media are essentially conservatives. And the liberals and the progressives are merely probably around maybe seven to uh, ten percent. Yeah, um, I did not exactly say that uh, the conservatives are bad and the progressives are always good, but I'm just stating the fact that you know uh, conservatism has taken place. That what we call the conservative turn has taken place, and so the idea that uh, that there is this decline of the liberal order. Uh, can truly be seen and witnessed. And I think uh, if you look at the big data analytics from uh, you know, how religious people are engaging the internet and social media, you can definitely see the, uh, the, the data sets on that. I've seen the data sets for Indonesia. Uh, and I, I think if you were to look at it from the uh, bigger um, research done, let's say by pure research, uh, survey, for instance, you would probably see more or less the same kind of uh, dynamics going on. Um, what 
this entails, I think, uh, is this. Uh, I mean, during this pandemic, we have seen essentially two sort of uh, global trends among the religious communities, right? So uh, there is on the one hand, uh, you know, religious groups uh, who are in this sort of constant state of denial regarding the existence of the virus, yeah, uh, or the need and urgency for the emergency laws uh, pertaining to uh, the pandemic. And then there are those, uh, you know, on the other extreme who are sort of naively relying on the help of God or, uh, you know, the deities uh, to protect them from uh, the virus, right? So they think that the sacred houses or uh, holy places of worship could protect them, right? So by statements uh, saying that they are soaked in Jesus' blood or that using the wudu or the, you know, uh, ablution from your prayers that you are protected from the virus and so on and so forth, right? But in the middle, you also see uh, a reasonable um, kind and like-minded uh, uh, religious people who are in support of these uh, social restrictions. And in fact, in the case of Indonesia, the highest Muslim um, religious um, council, for instance, have issued fatwas pertaining to the pandemic, which include among others, for instance, restrictions on uh, congregational prayers, uh, for Friday prayers, for Islamic festivities like Idul al Fitri, Idul al Adha, including prayers during Ramadan, which are usually celebrated, you know, for a whole month, right? And, and so you do find a spectrum of religious perspectives and ideas and, and the responses to the pandemic. But I think uh, what's unfortunate sometimes is that we are also seeing uh, you know, ignorance and negligence on the part of some religious communities because of their uh, unbelief um, toward the, uh, the virus and the pandemic, and hence that they are uh, usually against the social restrictions imposed by the government. Yeah? But I think uh, in the case of Indonesia, for the most part, I think the religious authorities and leaders have pretty much uh, been engaged uh, and fully aware of the dangers of the infection rates and the death and the destructions to um, communities. Um, and hence, they have been working uh, quite closely with the government. In fact, many of the Islamic uh, organizations, as well as the other faith communities, have contributed quite a lot um, to the uh, fight against the COVID-19. Uh, we saw, for instance, the Muhammadiyah, which has a uh, you know huge network of hospitals, clinics, and um, you know. Uh, houses of worships and so on across the country that they have contributed uh, hundreds of millions of US dollar, uh, uh, you know, uh, contributions uh, to fight against the pandemic. The same thing with the Nahdlatul Ulama, which has a, you know, a network of Islamic boarding schools and facilitating the mass vaccination of local communities and so on and so forth. I myself was vaccinated in um, Nahdlatul Ulama Pesantren near my home, uh, you know, where they facilitated the vaccination of the local communities. And so we are seeing both the positive and the negative um, uh, responses to the pandemic. All right. Uh, so any of the panelists want to address? If not, we can ask. Ushi San, my co moderator. Any questions coming up? Oh, I see Ted a little bit. Yeah. So, well, Ted answers, Toshi will gather, right? And I would like to also flag uh, if there are young students listening and watching out there, right? We, we seem to be talking about you all the time. So, if you could what, pose a question to our panelists, that would be great, right? Uh, younger generation also can, uh, can, uh, can, in, can ask questions. All right, Ted, you wanted to say something to this? Uh, same one. I'm not really planning to answer your question, if that's oh, no, okay. Really. okay. Yeah. Good. So what I, I, I just remembered that I, I had forgotten to say one thing, which I think I, I do need to say, and that is that uh, I wanted to share that in the face of one of the challenges, which is that uh, we also try to do, uh, let, let me put it briefly, we, we feel that we found a way to genuinely support young adults to take leadership and to do so with great verve. And also, and in the process to learn a lot of English. 
we've attempted to do this course in various countries, but in response to direct repression of our attempts to do these courses, we have also gone online. And, uh, and so that's, uh, so, so we have actually developed a, a, a whole crew of tutors um, because one-on-one -on -one teaching is generally pretty safe um, uh, from even very, very uh, controlling and surveilling and repressive govern governments. So, but, but we're very excited about that because we, those who are doing the tutoring are really excited. Uh, uh, you know, teachers love to teach um, and teaching one-on-one -on -one is, is quite a, a luxury in a way, but it's in this case, it's necessary and it's, it's going well. I had just wanted to say that. All right. Yes, Lucy, any? Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't see any questions. Uh, just uh, a few comments posted on, on the chat box. Uh, very positive uh, reaction to uh, Sue's description of her project from Kampui, actually, who's one of the actually authors of the, of the book, uh, working in, in Laos in the educational sector, saying uh, for information, PAKA APAKA, I think this is his uh, uh, project, is undertaking participatory youth research with the title of My Future, My Choice. We are now in the process of co-creating research approach with 30 uh, selected youth representing from high school graduates and university slash college graduates. So uh, there's probably a space for collaboration. And to that uh, uh, campus intervention, somebody else, uh, replied saying, uh, hello, Kampui, I'm, I'm also based in Laos. It would be great to uh, get connected. Uh, I'm finalizing a, a social impact product uh, with a group of uh, marginalized community for the conversation, uh, co conservation of the Asian elephant. Uh, so there's some uh, interaction it's going Asian. on on the chat box. Yeah, that's it so far. So if there are no questions, then maybe, oh wait, there comes one, I see one chat. Oh, see? Yeah, just came in. Uh, let me just uh, read it out loud. How to make the local wisdom in the global way for the sustainability program? How to make the local wisdom in the global way for the sustainability program? Is there a person? Is it directed to any person or is it just a... I know, uh, I guess for everyone. Okay, so any brave panelists would like to take that on? Maybe I will uh, put Sue in the hot seat, right? Since Ted and uh, Vicky have answered. Yes, Sue. Um, yeah, actually we've been doing some similar work with the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact and um, um, trying to also find out how uh, Indigenous people have been responding to the pandemic. And um, I, I, you know, it's to me, they feel really left out. They feel like they've been overlooked. Um, they feel like um, they're at risk and that they haven't been very well protected. Um, but again, I think that they're very, there's a lot of motivation to help we gave young people some small grants to, to help their communities and um, pretty amazed at the projects they did. Things from um, entrepreneurial training to help out people who couldn't sell their farming produce to make alternative money sources to helping um, teachers connect with their students when the schools were closed. Um, so I think that uh, the first thing, and, and one of the speakers said this this morning, the first thing is you have to reach out and make the connections with that community. And to, to bring in local communities, you actually have to work with local communities. You can't just assume what they know and what they think. You really have to engage them. And it is a process of mentoring and building the relationship first to give them an opportunity to be able to express what they want in their way and and in fact i think the the example from indonesia this morning with the um Kota Kita, they do a lot of working at really grassroots level and i would really applaud that kind of work of how you do reach out to get that local knowledge and we heard about how the women know everything in the community so i think that's part of it as well 
acha one you want to add bit because your 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 description of the project also is quite interesting right but uh, you okay. said children but uh, is there a di- gender dimension to it uh, indigenous people involved in that project uh yes uh so uh if we go back to the bird watching project that we give to the local communities um we at first we start using like the common name of the birds or of the technique but after that some of the student many of them are the hill tribes in uh, nan province uh, we have about uh, 50 ethnicity t- in, in nan province in thailand so uh, they provide a description of the bird in their local language as well as some of the equipment or some of the arts in their local heritage that is very unique to them. So uh, I think what we need to do is try to make a space, something of a blank space for these uh, young people so that they can have something to fill in for their own subculture or their own heritage so that they can feel like empowered for their what what did they have? Chang Guang, uh, one person raising her hand, and also another question coming from uh, uh, someone. I think she's a young person by the name of uh, Kesuma Yanti. Yes, go ahead. Uh, perhaps uh, Kesuma, w- would you be willing to speak up? We can unlock you. Hello, do you, do you guys hear me? Okay. So, Hi. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The question. Uh, I do. Yeah. Okay. Please. I am a third year student at Zhuang Gong University, and I do have a questions about the, how we can make um a youth youth feel more like that their voice is really can make change, and how uh, we can convince the youth to um be more uh, focused on our activity on civil engagement to be make um, the real change in our society. Yeah, that is my question. Mm. But do you have your own way? I mean, you're a young person, right? Uh, do you, yes. what, would, what, would, what would make you in, more engaged if you're not already engaged? What sort of techniques or what sort of topics? I mean, you know what I mean? Rather than asking we old people how to get young people engaged. <laughs> uh, I, I am running um, the program in my faculty is an uh, international forum about young ASEAN le- leaders policy initiative and I feel like that a lot of Thai students um, feel less like um, feel like they're not kind of related to civil engagement uh, and I think um, civil engagement is like the, the foundations of democracy or things that we can relate to really make change for our society to be a better place. But I think that um, the youth feel like it is unreal and, and in, impossible to be heard from doing civic, civic engagement thing. So like, I think this is like kind of, I want to know that how do we convict the youth to feel like their voice or a thing that they do on civic engagement is really the things that can make change in our community. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you saw the, you heard the question. So any panelists would like to... Okay, may I uh, answer yeah. uh, this question? Uh, I think uh, the thing is that you need to have some kind of exposure to some of the, maybe the problem or be the topics that in the communities. So what we have at the our department is that we usually have what we call uh, biology camp, which actually have the student to engage with the local high school student. So in any activities, it's not just the, like uh, the academic, but it's something else. So we have uh, them like uh, do some activities and they have dialogue going on between them. And some of the comment that we get later on is that we never know that this happened before. So I think that is the really important, that is the spark that inspired many of our students. They want to go back, they want to help, they want to do something. So I think it's how, to we, how can we have a platform to engage the people to have dialogue, okay? Whether it's like a, maybe a different generation or different culture, different localities, so that they can have 
this type of dialogue usually is not in the formal setting. As I said, uh, that usually during the lunch break or during the coffee break or maybe late night talking, something like that. So that they can have some exchange of the idea of what should they do, what should, uh, that they should help the others. Okay, I think Ted was faster to the draw than yeah, Dickie. Um, yeah, thanks. And I know that Gesuma's question is pending also. Um, I, I, I want to I want to try to say that I, I think your question is very good. Napat uh, Sakon, right? Uh, um, and the, the, what, the question I would ask is what happens when Thai students try to make their voice known to the Thai government? This is civic engagement. This is peaceful, civic, creative engagement. Uh, well, sometimes they're okay, but other times they are met with tear gas and with police and rubber bullets, and that's pretty dangerous, you know? So uh, it doesn't surprise me that many young adults feel hopeless about changing, for example, the Thai power structure. What happens when Myanmar students demonstrate they're killed? You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I feel it's really important to introduce or to include in our discussion of transformative learning a wider field that is very honest about power and how power is constructed. And, and here I just want to say one more thing briefly. One of the very beautiful things I feel about this group um, that is partly coming out of Chulalongkorn and partly out of Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies and partly this book, the Civic Engagement Group, is that I feel that underlying there's a very open concept of transformative learning that actually societies that people whole groups of people learn together, you know that when young people try something and then they get a reaction from the government, for example, well they have to think about it and everybody gets to a chance to learn from that. We are also learning from each other now and and for me that's a very beautiful and promising concept that's quite open and, and it has roots in uh, working class movements. It has words, roots in adult education and in other kinds of campaigns for change. But I do think we have to be very honest about the power politics that are constraining youth voices. Diki, okay. and then we go to the second question, right? The Sumal's question. Yeah, Diki. Yeah, um, actually I, I would like to sort of combine the two questions because the questions are really sort of intertwined and uh, really essentially hitting on the role of youths. And to be honest with you, the ICRS um, always uh, tries to as much as possible to engage youths in our program. In fact, we have specific programs on youth such as the interfaith youth pilgrimage where we would bring in youths from different provinces and districts to come together to learn from each other and to visit you know, the different sacred places of uh, the religious others and learn how to live together and be together and work together, collaborate and so on and so forth, yeah? That's one thing I'd like to say. But then the other thing is I remember our conference in 2016 when we invited Bikuni Damananda in Bangkok uh, at uh, Chula, where she highlighted uh, the fact that, you know, any form of social transformation begins with a personal transformation. Yeah? And I think uh, that holds true for, you know, people who are in the educational sector, you know, we believe in personal transformation as much as social transformation. And I think when uh, the younger you are, the easier you are to sort of, uh, you know, learn new things and expose yourself to new skill sets and mindsets and so on. And so um, to be frank, it's easier for us to um, you know, convince uh, the young people, the millennials yeah, uh, on, on um, how to sort of see the world and see the reality and how to think critically. But I think um, there's a sort of catch uh, in, in that sort of logic because um, it seems like you know, through the various research on the millennials, there seems to be some understanding that uh, you know, the current, millennial generation uh, you know has a certain kind of uh, logic uh, and way of thinking right uh, that they are not so much um, 
drawn into sort of traditional conventional organizations and religions and you know uh, community uh, uh, you know formations and so on but they are much more driven by cause specific causes right and and hence there is uh, you know uh, this lack of loyalty I'm not quite sure how true that is um, but just seeing the uh, sort of amount of energy and enthusiasm among the young people, uh, you know, who are engaging in digital activism and the internet and uh, social media in all kinds of issues, I think uh, tells us something, right? That they are committed to uh, many uh, strategic issues that are being uh, confronted by both the state and uh, society. As for Kasuma's uh, question, I think in the context of Indonesia, we are blessed by the new uh, sort of our young millennial uh, minister of education who has introduced this idea of Merdeka Blajar or essentially autonomous learning uh, or independent learning whereby one can take any courses from any universities to you know, build up their interest uh, enthusiasm in any field. And so I think this is one sort of approach to sort of liberalize, if you like, uh, um, you know, our youth and to make them be more interested in, uh, you know, the many things that may not be necessarily, um, you know, accommodated uh, in your usual sort of uh, study programs uh, in conventional uh, universities. Thank you. Okay. Right. Uh, I think we have one minute left, right? Tosi? Looks like on my clock. We've got uh, about 10 minutes. Huh? Really? My clock must be yeah, very we, slow. <laughs> well, we, can, we can go to uh, three. Right? I mean, three bands of time. Yeah. So yeah. I can see like maybe six more minutes, six or seven. Okay. Uh, I mean, maybe I put in my five cents worth right, is they can't wait to get out of those classrooms and learn in real life situations. Right? And they, they're fed out of writing essays, right? And of course, we try to accommodate by now including, oh, you can, you can do a podcast, you can do a short video, right? But still, uh, that is the form, right? It doesn't provide the content. So that's why I tried to do in my own way, uh, study trips, when, which went on for 14 years, which was extracurricular, non-credited. And my basic recipe is I expose my students to people who have a mission, people who are inspiring and who work against the odds, you know, uh, um, civil society groups largely, right, in this, in this um, study trips, all right, so they are doing, uh, doing all kinds of work, whether it's environmental work, work with sex workers, uh, promoting interfaith, and I let my students chew on that, right? I don't tell them, uh, I don't, I don't connect the dots, right, I have a, pro I have a certain plan in mind, but I let them connect the dots, and I find they, they relish, they relish in this kind of situation, right? It's not, maybe not like what Ted would do in language, but it is more like you go, you listen to these people talk, you watch them uh, tell the story, you watch them do, uh, you see them at work, these various civil society groups, and then they write about it, all right? They write about it in blogs or they make a short podcast about that. And I think I, I, I when I, when I see their product and I read this stuff, I find that they are, they're not conservatives at all, you know? They want to make the world a better place for themselves first, yeah, and then it goes up, right? Maybe the conservatives are the, the middle age and those who have already invested too much in the particular lifestyle or in the particular system. They are afraid of change, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yes, Toshi, you want to also add your 10 cents worth because you do do your kind of work, right, with in mm -hmm. environmental uh, education with villagers and fisher folk and all that. What has been your observation in a, recipe, a kind of recipe for transformative learning? If you like, um, I can probably mention that in a wrap up. I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I meant to invite Kesuma to voice a question, but Dicky already answered her question before she voiced it. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, her question is basically uh, I mean, you, you can read it in the chat box, but how, how um, she can actually, or we can actually apply. But, uh, what you learn at university or other educational institutions to back to the community uh, or or our real life, uh, yeah. 
So that's all I need to say at this point. And back to you, Sengra. All right. So you want to preserve this for the wrap up. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, time was always not enough, right? We have started a conversation which we can continue on offline and I'm sure in other civic engagement activities uh, when COVID-19 dies down and we can meet each other face to face. We can go bird watching with uh, Tatawan's group. We can go and do an interfaith pilgrimage with Diki across Java maybe. We can learn, we can relearn English again through TED. We can do action research with Sue, with young people. Uh, so I think the possibilities are all there. So with that, I pass back to Michiko-san. There's something else there, announcements? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sengwan and Toshi-san. So um, we are going into a wrap up session. Um, I once again invite Toshi-san and Sengwan to um, to synthesize, provide some synthesis of the discussions, insights and ideas that emerge from the panels. And then I would like to invite Ajahn Surichai Wangeo, if he can make it uh, into this time, a professor emeritus uh, of, uh, and the director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Chalonko University to give some closing remarks. So over to you, Toshi-san and Sengwan. Uh, would you like to go first or you, you want me to go first? Maybe I should, I should go first while <laughs> you're still thinking, no? Are, are you wrapping up your session or are you going to wrap up session one and two together? Or? Uh, sort of together. Okay, you go first because you have more time to think. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, it's uh, Sorry, but uh, it's impossible to cover everything uh, that has been you know raised uh, during our discussion uh, throughout the day, because uh, we hear you know so many things, but definitely to me uh, a takeaway for the day for me is uh, how to promote or build partnerships uh, in times of uh, a crisis and, and uncertainty. Um, in the morning, I heard more of because we're facing increasing crisis maybe opportunities are opening up because we realize that uh, we can't just handle this crisis uh, uh, within our, our usual thinking and we have to outreach uh, you know, others and, and different perspectives and, and things like that. So that's, that's, that's good, that's the way it should be. But on the other hand, particularly in the afternoon during the second panel, I think I heard uh, uh, a different and more pessimistic direction whereby when people face a uh, crisis, uh, we tend to go for um, easy uh, and simple answers. And usually by, by finding um, enemies. And these enemies are usually uh, uh, people who are different from, from you. Uh, you know, people like migrant workers coming from outside or uh, people uh, of uh, different religious uh, uh, beliefs or, or ethnic backgrounds and so on and so forth. Um, trying to trying to um, uh, you know uh, see them as enemies and 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 we talk or or, or act as if uh, if we can do something about these people we can solve the problem. Um, similarly, we also uh, try to find strong uh, leaders who could uh, solve all these uh, problems and crises uh, for 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 us. Um, these answers and solutions are, are extremely superficial and, and uh, 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 they're just not effective. But because we are facing um, crisis, we tend to uh, uh, get into this mode, um, in, in the mode of thinking. So I'm, I'm trying to, to think how we can prevent the second tendency and promote the, the previous, the first tendency. And I think I have observed uh, some uh, ideas um, uh, during uh, uh, the sessions uh, today. Uh, of course, uh, they may not be nothing really new or earth shaking, but first one is particularly when we think about, we, we need learning definitely, uh, but when we think about learning, we tend to focus on intellectual uh, aspect of learning and, and also knowledge. But uh, uh, we could also 
exploit or explore um, in um, our spiritual sphere and the emotional or, or feeling, you know, spheres um, um, to, to make our learning more effective. Um, and also hands-on direct experiences with people and also the nature um, is also important. But a trick here is of course, um, it's exactly in, in the, the emotional, uh, spiritual uh, uh, sphere. That's where we sometimes tend to think very simplistically. So I'm sort of you know, begging, begging that question, but uh, this is definitely uh, one of the areas that we have to look into uh, uh, more seriously and, and, and more in-depth manners. And also, of course, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, uh, we should downplay uh, intellectual uh, analysis uh, when it comes to uh, our learning experiences, but perhaps our um, intellectual uh, uh, analysis needs to be expanded uh, to uh, the structural level, uh, not just uh, uh, around us, but uh, um, a much bigger uh, a perspective and analysis of what really uh, drives us uh, into one direction or, or another. So that kind of structural uh, analysis definitely needed. The second uh, idea that I have gotten from the panelists and other speakers is perhaps um, getting a realistic view of what we working in different sectors can do, where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are. For example, um, I'm basically coming from the, the, the NGO CSO sector, and we know that uh, uh, many NGOs uh, uh, are good at working at a ground level, uh, you know, uh, catering very uh, 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 tailored uh, services or assistance to, uh, to community people. Uh, but uh, as uh, one of the panelists pointed out, uh, we have limit, lots of limitations, for example, how we can share and expand uh, our uh, uh, lessons and, and good experience in the practices um, uh, much, much more widely so that uh, our practices uh, can actually have uh, impacts on policies and, and uh, much wider practices uh, or, or even shared with uh, uh, um, other organizations and um, other sectors in the society. Um, Conversely, uh, and but at the same time, NGOs need certain space in the society, and that allows us to to work in very flexible manners as well. And those spaces, uh, we we them we we ourselves sometimes cannot cannot create, but these spaces must be. Uh, fostered by uh, other sectors in the society, for example, the government. Um, and of course, the government is good at doing certain things, for example, uh, you know, creating more space for uh, people like us can work or, or community um, can, can take the initiatives. Um, but at the same time, when it comes to working more closely uh, with local communities or individual people uh, on the ground, the government has some limitations. So I think we have to have a uh, realistic uh, assessment of uh, where our strengths are and where our limitations are. Um, and we, without that kind of realistic assessment, we act like as if we are the ones who can provide, um, you know, answers to all these uh, difficult questions. And of course, this is, this is nothing new. Um, I think this is how we have been, you know, building and promoting civic engagement or multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues and, and things like that. Historically speaking, uh, starting from uh, you know decades ago, but we might be uh, forgetting forgetting that. So now, because we are facing a crisis, perhaps we should you know uh, stop and, and take a moment and think and reflect upon what we have been doing so far. Um, um, and that's where uh, we might be able to find some, some wisdom already, uh, which can guide us uh, for future direction. So that's my uh, major takeaway for the day. Um, secondly, uh, many of you might be wondering where we're going to go from here. Um, and as far as um, Chirongo University is concerned, for the rest of the fiscal year, um, we are thinking about, uh, or Chiranko University is thinking about uh, developing um, sort of a 
consolidated uh, uh, website because so far, because we have been doing so many things in, in different ways, uh, um, our experiences and, and reports and, and uh, things like that are, are uh, uh, posted on different websites and, and various places, including this publication that you got to uh, learn about this morning. So um, for the rest of the fiscal year, we're hoping to uh, create a more consolidated sort of one-stop uh, website where you can uh, visit and, and find out uh, uh, what, what, what's going on. Um, and also for the, the next year, um, I'm personally hoping to, to uh, uh, focus more on the uh, indigenous youth uh, community. And I mentioned that because uh, that topic uh, uh, was also brought up uh, during, uh, particularly during the second panel. So I'm glad to find out that many people are thinking uh, along, along similar lines. Uh, so that's all from me. So to you, Sengwa. Mm. Okay. So while you were talking, I was just scribbling stuff. So it's not really coherent, but uh, well, so first point I wrote there is uh, uh, keeping the faith. Uh, keeping the faith, the belief that there is still good in the world and that there are good people doing good things uh, despite pandemic, despite climate change. Um, people who wants to right the wrongs, yeah. People who wants to find a better way to live. Uh, the second, the second point I wrote there was spreading the faith. Yeah, in the sense, um, spreading this belief, this optimism to more people. And the way we do it is from what the panelists have said. Uh, we have to believe more, believe more in people through co-designing work. Right, we uh, we shouldn't follow an old script, follow an old template, but we should trust people in, especially those who are victims of this present system who are marginalized, to help us co-design in order to co-learn better, uh, rather than uh, otherwise. The second big word uh, was uh, interdisciplinary or intersectional way of learning. Right, to to join dots together not to study in a very parochial or narrow way, but to see the big picture while addressing local concerns. Um, and spreading the faith also involves building networks again, right? The, the, the very hard work of building networks across people who are like-minded, uh, but at the same time, people who are not so like-minded, but who wants to learn, right? Who wants to change, right? Uh, that means people who are hungry for answers, and uh, are already fed up with the old answers. So to put it in the big the academic terminology nowadays in the literature, we have to decolonize how we learn, decolonize what we learn, uh, how, how we have been learning, because the, the generally the colonial mentality is about monopoly, it's about making everything the same, it's non-participatory. So we are fighting a very old, uh, if you like, mindset, an old structure, an old philosophy, which is quite colonial. This not necessarily just coming from the West, but from within our own uh, countries and nation states. So that's my own spiel. So I think Achan Suricha is next, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Ajahn Surichai, yes. can you hear, 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 hear us? Yes. yes. May we please invite you to speak a, speak a few words. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, so I, this is a very important moment uh, when, when we ima imagine we are in the midst of uh, COVID-19 and we are uh, able to meet each other online, uh, discussing about civic engagement uh, in this very uh, strong pressures from the emergencies. Uh, I, I think this is uh, to, to really uh, situate uh, ourselves together in this new context of uh, unfolding difficulties, but yet uh, we, we are called upon to, to confirm our faith 
confirm our hope and make sure that we uh, are together in uh, be feeling, feeling not alone, but feeling as a part of each other. Uh, so in, a, in solidarity, we, we are able to, to meet. And, and so this is a very, for me, this is a, the first point that I would like to, to say, uh, thank you so much for the time that uh, you all have given and the, the attention. Uh, since uh, the start of the thinking of uh, you know, civic engagement together, uh, through your different concrete experiences. And, and so uh, we, we were able to see each other through uh, the, the, the days before COVID came, <laughs> Seven, uh, 2017. Uh, and, and we were uh, able to witness the product of uh, dedication and work as a book, in a book form that we were able to launch. So, uh, and, and we, today we were able to meet each other, many among us to get, uh, through to this, we confirm our uh, sense of uh, share, sharing and also uh, our solidarity that we can move ahead. So this is my first point. Uh, on behalf of Chula, uh, which is a, an academic institution, uh, but uh, as you can hear from the president, we also do wish to, to see how in this context of very challenging time, Chula can also uh, really take uh, the keyword of co-production of knowledge. I mean, learning together with not only uh, the academic uh, discipline people, but also cross uh, boundaries. And, and that means co-production of knowledge that we were uh, sharing. Uh, also, the, the president was sharing that co-generation of knowledge for the future together. So that in that spirit, uh, I would like to really uh, strengthen the, the direction of our civic engagement in the light of the demands of our, our context, uh, wherever we are. I think we all emphasize on the local communities, uh, local uh, engagement, but we are also, uh, also very clear uh, in, in uh, my third point, I should like to say about the, the structural issue in the, in the world that we are living in. And the, the kind of structural uh, uh, understanding of the processes that make us come to this very difficult uh, period and also make us to see that uh, COVID is not only, is not, is a very problematic situation for all of us, but it also reveals a lot of issues that we, we really uh, were not able to understand and to look into. But uh, the time issue is very tight. Uh, the urgency is, with us, and uh, as uh, Madame uh, Ibu uh, Vitola said, uh, we can not only allow the, th the the luxury of thinking about the new keywords, but we we all have to respond immediate challenges around us wherever we are. But in, the light, in that light, the structural context uh, we are living in our local and global context demands that we see the structural connectivity among us. I mean, uh, with uh, the, the commitment from our uh, friends in the UN system, uh, through uh, Madame Kita Suprawal and also uh, Dr. Susan Weiss, uh, the UN system also is being called upon to be more uh, adaptive and more uh, working, not only in the high level uh, political forum of the kind, which is important, but also engaging with civic uh, en uh, engagement 
panels and also working relationships with communities. And with this, I think uh, we are all uh, seeing together that uh, with this, uh, our talk, our discussion as university need to be uh, uh, not only learning or co-learning with uh, the, the people who are really in action together outside campus, but we also would like to see how we can create a, a more uh, meaningful connectedness or, or meaningful connectivity, uh, not only the, the mechanical sense or uh, elect, uh, you, you know, the, the digital sense, but we also hope that this uh, goes along with our human sense of connectedness in, in the world that demands our compassion, demands a lot of our, our human humanity to respond to some issues that beyond uh, our own con specific context. For this, I would like to end by uh, relating the context of the regional civic engagement uh, that we have uh, been uh, together and we hope to go beyond today is uh, to also see that our university uh, and working with other universities, but working with all of you uh, who, who have been really great friends along this. Uh, and we would like to see how we engage with, uh, to collaborate with uh, uh, in, the, in the global sense of uh, making sense of the global uh, direction together and accelerate it in, in a meaningful way uh, so that uh, we, we all can uh, make our university a part of a new adaptive uh, possibility uh, to work with all of you. Uh, Toshi was talking about some efforts to see new consolidation, uh, new, uh, uh, you know, on or something like a more, more uh, technical, technically possible uh, in bringing all the work together uh, in, in uh, some way or the other in the next uh, stage. But I will also would like to see the, the next stage that uh, we, uh, I, I have to, oh, I forgot to tell you one thing. Uh, because uh, uh, good, uh, if, uh, Ahmad, if, uh, if I, uh, was talking about uh, Sukar uh, 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 Solo, uh, where we met. And, and uh, I think all of you may remember that uh, we had uh, Mr. Pong Sak uh, Ying Chom Jaren as a part of our he, uh, a mayor meeting. He was one among the mayor's meeting uh, over there together with all of us. He's, he's, uh, he has been now at the, in the fourth term elected as a mayor of Yala uh, City Municipality. Yala is in the midst of the very a ten, uh, very hot spot of southern part of Thailand where, and he, what you, re, you might remember, he got the UNESCO Peace uh, City for Peace Award. And now you see Mr. Pong Sak, the reason I want to tell, mention this because he has been uh, now uh, a president of Thai Federation of Municipalities. Uh, so I, I, I think he would be ha much happy to, to follow up with this because just uh, about one week ago, he was able to uh, give a strong uh, declaration on how the local governments would like to see the vaccines being more accessible uh, equally uh, without uh, 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 over uh, bureaucratization system. To, to uh, have access to vaccine justice in in the in the local uh, de development uh, uh, system of Thailand, so that that he gave the statement to the government. I mean, in a friendly term, it, it was a sent as a letter from the federation, but it was uh, made clear that uh, so this is a part of uh, you know uh, our our network, and and Mr. I am sure within the year or the next year, 
uh, we can also see how uh, our network could be uh, working through uh, the, the uh, Mr. Yong Sak and the new, new friends along this line. With the context of uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, as everyone know, it has uh, been already five, year, five months after coup d'etat. And I think everyone knows that we all may need to see not only our specific context, but also to see the region as a more context of our civic uh, challenge. And I know the UN system also being a part of hoping to push further and the ASEAN system also being uh, the, uh, called upon to be more uh, working to guarantee a, a more uh, hope for a more peaceful context for Myanmar transition. But all these are big challenges for, for all of us. So with all this, I would like to mention, uh, just to uh, highlight our thanks to, to uh, the editors of the book, uh, uh, Muhammad Indrawan and uh, Ted, uh, and all the speakers, keynote speakers, and our also panelists. Uh, I do hope that uh, we can uh, come back in, in uh, online context and discussion uh, in, in thematic terms uh, very soon. Uh, just also to mention uh, the last one about uh, one another possibility because Chula, Chula Lungkorn has been quite, uh, make some effort to work with uh, under UNESCO efforts along the line of thinking about the future, engaging with the future challenges and your discussion about youth, about the concern for bringing intergenerational uh, uh, platform into a part of a civic engagement into the future is very much appreciated. So along that line, the, uh, we have a future literacy uh, uh, as a, a key focus where we also would like to engage. So with, with that word, I would like to follow up. Uh, Michiko Sang is with us here. So we hope to follow up uh, after this meeting so that we, we uh, just make this, uh, you know, this friendly uh, interaction but as uh, with some sense of mission together that we do have big challenges so that we can try to make uh, whatever possible around us, but also make our network as a strong, uh, a strong uh, force uh, to, to uh, put up ourselves as a part to respond to the, our common, uh, you know, common challenges and risk together. So with, with that, uh, may I wish all of you uh, uh, good health and uh, also uh, hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn Suichai, and thank you very much for coming in today. I know that it was very difficult to, to manage your also schedule. Really appreciate. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we have heard also a lot of um, follow up um, action um, ideas, and uh, I'm sure we're going to continue this conversation, but now we come to the end of the conference. And to all speakers, panelists, resource persons, partners, and, and our participants, very engaging participants for your contributions. And my special appreciation also goes to the technical facilitating team from Inside Pact and my team from the Office of International Affairs and Global Network who have worked hard uh, behind the scenes to make this conference a success. Thank you very much for joining today's conference, Civic Engagement in Asia, Co-Designing Resilient Global Communities. Given our extremely limited uh, mobility situation these days and possibility, uh, possibly for many more months ahead, the need for meaningful dialogue and engagement is ever increasing. So I hope we can continue to be engaged in the civic engagement platform to collaborate and combine our efforts toward co-designing resilient global communities. We look forward to continuing the conversation continuing the support for each other, for our colleagues and friends in challenging situation and meeting with you again in the next program.
สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับ Thank you all Thank you Toshi Thank you all Thank you Thank you Thank you Thank you Bye everyone Bye Bye